Good morning. I'd like to call this meeting to order and welcome us to the third meeting of the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Natural Resources of the 2023-2024 Interim. If members are joining us virtually, please be sure to keep your video on so that we know we have a quorum. And please also be sure to mute your microphone when you're not speaking to minimize background noise. Please do remember that the chat feature is only to be used for technical assistance from our broadcast and production services staff. At this time, will the secretary please call roll. Senator Goykachia. Present. Senator Scheibel. Here. Assemblywoman Anderson. Present. Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod. Here. Assemblyman DeLong. Present. <laughs> Assemblyman Gurr. Here. Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch. Chair Pazina. Present, and thank you so much. Um, please do mark Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch present when she arrives. All right, our agenda today includes presentations on outdoor recreation in Nevada, as well as various presentations related to wildlife and natural resource management. As usual, before we begin, I'd like to reiterate some housekeeping announcements. First, this committee is oftentimes paperless, meaning that materials are provided electronically. Anyone who'd like to receive electronic notification of and access to the committee's agendas, minutes, and final report can do so by signing up on the Nevada Legislature's website. This means that committee members oftentimes are reviewing the meeting materials on their laptop, so if you see us on our laptops, please do not take this as a sign of inattention to the presentations. Second, as a note to our presenters, all presenters are asked to make sure to turn on their microphones before they begin their presentation. If a committee member has any questions during or after your presentation, please identify yourself each time you respond to a question. This will assist our secretary in completing the minutes for the meeting. And third, a note about public comment. During the interim, meetings typically have two opportunities for public comment, once at the beginning and once at the end. Members of the public may provide public comment in different ways, all of which are listed on the agenda. For anyone wishing to call in for a public comment, please dial 888-475-4499 and when prompted to provide the meeting ID, please enter 857-5226-9048 and then press pound. Broadcast and production service staff will indicate to you when it is your turn to speak. We do ask that public comment made in person or by phone be kept to two minutes so that everyone interested in speaking can be accommodated and to ensure that we can get through the agenda in a very timely fashion. Speakers are urged to avoid repetition of comments made by previous speakers. If you've heard a previous speaker share the comment that you'd like to make, please don't feel ashamed to say ditto. If you'd like to provide written comment, please either submit via email before, during, or after the meeting to nrinterim at lcb.state.nv.us or mail the comments to the Research Division at 401 South Carson Street, Carson City, Nevada, 89701 or you can fax them to 775-684-6400. Given the number of presentations on today's agenda, the committee will take a 30 minute break for lunch around noon today. Before we get started with public comment, I would like to note the following. The weather up north today is expected to be a little hazardous for our members who are attending in person in Carson City, for our staff members, and for those visitors who are attending the session. As a result, we are going to try to keep things moving at a pretty rapid pace today. So again, if you've already heard the comment that you'd like to make, please feel free to say ditto. Keep your comments to a very timely fashion so that we can keep everyone safe and sound from Northern Nevada today. And with that, let's start our first public comment section. If there's anyone wishing to provide public comment here in Las Vegas, please feel free to come to the table now. Welcome. We have former Commissioner June Kiliani. It's a pleasure to see you and please um, spell your name and say your name and proceed when ready. 
Thank you. Don't take it off my time. I just want to note that <laughs> Senator Goykichi and I sat next to each other. Maureen Landing somehow managed to do both our names without stumbling, so I always appreciated that. Chris June Kellyani, G-I-U-N-C-H-I-G-L-I-A-N-I. -I, I'm speaking on agenda item 13. The Wildlife Commission has been a plum governor, governor's appointment rather than a commission created to work on behalf of and giving guidance to the department. The appointments, whether by a Democratic or Republican governor, were the same, a political thank you or support for those who see wildlife only as a sport for hunters. It's long overdue to make the commission more responsive in its membership to what its mission is. You could change it from an all-governor appointed to a mix of legislative leadership and the governor or consent vote or anything that might help, but it ignores the real issue. The Nevada Department of Wildlife manages 900 different species of fish, birds, mammals, amphibians, reptiles, and their habitats in the Silver State. The wildlife's mission is to protect, conserve, manage, and restore wildlife and its habitat for the aesthetic, scientific, educational, recreational, and economic benefits to the citizens of Nevada and the United States, and to promote the safety of persons using vessels. I submit the makeup of seats should both reflect the mission statement and include diversity of our state. In fact, all of Nevada's commission should reflect gender, diversity, and tribal representation. The commission should be made up of people that are in biology, botany, conservation, basin management, orthonologists, water, forestry, land use, and habitat. There are women and minorities that could fill any of these roles. It's been overtly controlled by ranchers, farmers, guides, and hunters. Their voice should be heard, so include one, but, don't re but they don't really contribute to the mission of the department. They represent those who make money from wildlife. Currently, there are five, five sportsmen, one rancher, one farmer, one conservation, one public member. All are white, and only one is a woman. None are black, Hispanic, Asian, Middle Eastern, and none that I'm aware of represent Native Americans on whose land we hunt, fish, and recreate. In addition to the composition of the commission, the NRS should be reviewed and pared down. It's a hodgepodge of duties that really should not be in statute. Many are managerial in nature. Our state's natural resources and lands and animals should not be ruled by a non-diverse group nor by political paybacks. You need scientists and people with expertise. I urge you to at least change the makeup to be more reflective of Nevada and its unique and beautiful landscape with all that live amongst it. Thank you. Thank you. You kept that to about two minutes and three seconds. So, <laughs> so thank you so much. And just the spelling of your name, I was, it's wonderful to see you this morning. Do we have anyone else in Las Vegas who'd like to make public comment? Okay, please come to the table. And if there's anyone else in Las Vegas, also please feel free to sit at one of the chairs at this time. Please feel free to come on up. And again, we are keeping this to two minutes so that we can keep all of our members, visitors, and staff safe and sound up in Northern Nevada. Please turn on your mic and share your name with us. Thank you so much. How's that? Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to address the Joint Interim Standing Committee. My name is Pat Cummings. I am the president of the Las Vegas-based fraternity of the Desert Bighorn. The Desert Bighorn sheep are Nevada's state animal. The Desert Bighorn sheep are the iconic symbol of Nevada. The fraternity of the Desert Bighorn was organized in 1964 and is considered the world's first wild sheep conservation organization. Since inception, the fraternity has worked closely with NDOW to enhance water availability for desert bighorn sheep and at least 67 other terrestrial and avian species in many of the mountain ranges in the southern two-thirds of the state. The fraternity of the desert bighorn asserts that the Nevada Wildlife Commission has history of and continues to effectively represent Nevadans across all 17 counties in establishing policy, setting regulations, approving project funding, and listening and considering public comment and interests on wildlife, wildlife habitat, and boating-related matters. The fraternity strongly recommends retaining the structure and background categories of the Wildlife Commission. The fraternity of the Desert Bighorn recognizes that the commission has and remains well-versed in myriad issues and matters throughout the rural, suburban, and urban areas of this great state. Thank you. Thank you very much, and we'll welcome our next speaker. Matt Blackburn, um, I'll just keep it short and sweet and say ditto to what Pat just said. Thank you both so much.
Ron Stoker with uh, Wildlife and Habitat Improvement in Nevada. We're also a nonprofit conservation organization like the Fraternity of Desert Bighorn. Our volunteers have made over a million dollars this last year to support wildlife, and we like to say ditto to the fraternities. Thanks. Thank you so much to all three of you, and thank you to Commissioner June Kelliani. Do we have anyone in Carson City who'd like to speak? If so, please come to the table. Thank you, Chair Senator Pazina and the members of the Interim Resources Committee for caring about outdoor recreation and conservation. My name is Rose Wolterbeek, W-O-L-T as in Tom, E-R, B as in boy, E-E-K, and I'm with the Sierra Club. We at the Sierra Club have been working on expanding access to outdoor recreation by encouraging public transportation options while still being mindful of the biggest threat to Nevada and our public lands, the climate crisis. Other states have look, started to look at a transit to trails program that would support sustainable access to outdoor recreation, especially for those who might not have viable transportation to visit green spaces, while simultaneously looking to lower air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. As a lifelong hiker, cyclist, and Nordic skier, I know firsthand that Nevada has incredible, pristine land right out our back door. I believe that everyone should have access to the great outdoor, outdoors, just like I have for decades in northern Nevada and the Lake Tahoe region. With all of the outdoor recreation at our fingertips in Nevada, the chapter also thinks Nevada would be a prime candidate for such a program. I encourage the committee to look into what bringing a transit to trails program would look like in our state this interim session, and I do offer the support of the Sierra Club Toyobi chapter on this adventure. Truly yours, and thank you again for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. Thank you so much. And I've had an opportunity to learn more about the Transit to Trail programs, and it really is a great venture. Thank you so much. And our next speaker, please speak when you're ready. Hi. Good morning, uh, Chair Pazina and members of the committee. My name is Barry Levinson, B-A-R-I-L-E-V-I-N-S-O-N, and I'm a member of the Sierra Club. I would like to address uh, item 12, the makeup of the Wildlife Commission. The commission currently has nine members, and this is required to have five sportsmen, one rancher, one farmer, one conservationist, and one member of the public. The sportsmen include hunters, fishermen, or trappers. So seven of the nine members support the interests of sportsmen, ranchers, and farmers. Only two members may primarily be in support of the interests of wildlife. Based on a 2018 survey of Nevadans done by the University of Colorado, 22% of Nevadans believe that animals should be used and managed for human benefit, while 44% believe that wildlife are a part of our social network and that we should live in harmony. So twice as many of us believe that animals should not just be subjected to the whims of humans. All Nevadans are charged with being good stewards of wildlife, and presently the commission does not accurately represent all Nevadans. We want to ensure both urban and rural community members are adequately represented, and having seven of the nine commissioners representing interests that often conflict with wildlife interests does not ensure representation of Nevadans geographically or ideologically. One of the most egregious policies of the current commission is the refusal to ban wildlife killing contests in which animals are killed in large numbers for monetary or trophy awards. These contests cannot even be considered hunting. Many hunters are opposed to them as well and feel that they give hunters a bad name. Ten other states have banned or limited them, yet our commission has refused to pass this ban despite three petitions to do so. Due to these factors, Sierra Club supports a change in the composition of the Wildlife Commission to better reflect the values of the people of our state. We would suggest reducing the number of sportsmen on the commission and the addition of other members more representative of our diverse population. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this important topic. Two minutes on the dot. It's almost like you practiced. 
All right. Do we have, we're going to take two more speakers in Carson City and then go to the phones if we have them. Are there any more speakers in Carson City? If so, please get started and thank you. Hello, for the record, my name is Russell Coleman. I'm the executive director for the Nevada Wildlife Federation. When Americans started to notice the decline of our wildlife populations in the 20th century, conservation giants like Theodore Roosevelt, Aldo Leopold, and John Muir came to the conclusion that using the best available science was the necessary tool for wildlife management. While no one group can claim to be 100% responsible for the playbook that led to the successful return of these animals, just like no one person can claim they won the Super Bowl, the sporting community has been the captain of these efforts. Today, the Wildlife Conservation Playbook is called the North American Model of Wildlife Conservation. One of the most important tenets of the North American model states that science is the proper tool for discharge of wildlife policy. Simply put, that means that trained wild wildlife biologists should make decisions based on facts, professional experience, and the commitment to shared underlying principles. Personally, having a bachelor's degree in wildlife science, the first rule I learned is leave your personal opinion and bias out of wildlife management. As a hunter for over 25 years, I'm not here today to say that hunters should be the only ones to hold the keys to Nevada's wildlife. What I will say here today is that wildlife management decisions must be made using science, experience, and facts, and not left to the whims of personal bias or public opinions. The sporting community has shown their competency, dedication, and trust in the North American model of wildlife conservation, which has led past, current, and future generations from all backgrounds access to wildlife and suggesting that they not have not contradicts the fact that Nevada is home to the Sheldon National Wildlife Refuge, a refuge responsible for the recovery of the American antelope. It rejects the idea of the Desert National Wildlife Refuge, a refuge created to protect the best remaining sheep habitat country in the habitat in the country. In addition, suggesting the Nevada Wildlife Commission needs to be reformed goes against the fact that Nevada has the largest wild sheep population in the lower 48, the country's only population of Himalayan snowcock in the Ruby Mountains, and more recently, our state's first stable population of moose, and the first wolf sighting in northeast Nevada in over 100 years. This model works. Efforts to limit or remove the sporting community from its leadership position of wildlife management in Nevada solely because a small section of the public does not agree with our ideals is similar to removing the captain of a championship sports team and replacing them with the most popular fan in the bleachers. Neither is done based on facts and both would have disastrous results. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Our next speaker, please. Uh, Madam Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Joel Blakesley. I'm speaking for the Southern Nevada Coalition for Wildlife. I'm also on the board of directors for the Coalition for Nevada's Wildlife and the Nevada Trappers Association policy director. Um, basically, what I would like to say is there's a, a lot of talk about how hunters um, don't represent the general public. We're probably the most diverse group of people in this state. There are members in every race, religion, um, cultural group, Democrats, Republicans, independents, uh, men, women, uh, children. We, we represent the general public. And to, to, to have the idea that somehow we're a small group of people, we're not. We are Nevada. We're, we're everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. We are going to go to the phones because we have a number of people waiting on the phones as well and we do not want to leave them out. We'll come back. But for now, BPS, please take us to our first caller. Thank you, Chair. To provide public comment, please press star nine now on your phone to take your place in the queue. Good morning, committee members, and thank you for the opportunity to make comment. Uh, Bryce Pollock with the Nevada Back Chapter of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, for the record. I want to shine some perspective and hope to help you better understand the diversity of hunters and anglers in Nevada. Uh, last year, there were 156,385 license holders. We affectionately refer to these license holders as season ticket holders to the Nevada outdoors. For perspective, this is twice as many people as the season ticket holders to the Las Vegas Raiders, Golden Knights, and aviators combined. Nevada hunters and anglers make up a diverse group that is three times larger than the Culinary Workers Union. You may hear that Wildlife Commission lacks diversity by representing hunters and anglers, but it is important to remember that the commission is diverse by representing this group. When a commission represents hunters and anglers, 
It represents citizens of all ages, ethnicities, rural, urban, and all walks of life. License holders in Nevada range from 12 years of age to 80 years of age. The current Wildlife Commission has a good diversity in representing this group with commissioners' backgrounds ranging from the construction trades to professional legal careers and everything in between. You cannot refute the track record of hunters and anglers in restoring and improving the overall health of Nevada's wildlife. Representation from groups unwilling to follow the best available science and rather emotion or public opinion would be dangerous and irresponsible. As hunters and anglers with millions of dollars invested and thousands of hours volunteered, we want to know that our resources aren't going in vain by the management of groups without institutional knowledge. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. And just a reminder, if another speaker has already shared something that you'd like to share, please feel free to say ditto just so we can safely get our guests, members, and staff members in Carson City out before the snow comes. Caller with the last three digits, 987, please unmute by pressing star six. No response. Moving to the next caller, please proceed. Good morning, Chair Bazina and members of the committee. My name is Christina Erling, E-R-L-I-N-G, and I'm the Vice President of Government Affairs North America for Barrick, which is the operator of Nevada Gold Mines. We have been proud partners for the state of Nevada since the mid-1980s. In 2023 alone, Nevada Gold Mines' economic contributions to the state were more than $3.5 billion by way of taxes paid, goods and services purchased in Nevada, personnel costs, and social investments. We have stood with the state in the ups and downs of the Great Recession, and we stepped up to fill budget gaps during the COVID-19 pandemic. We've been proud to work with governors, legislators, and state agencies on matters of great importance, making changes in lockstep with the state to ensure the gold standard for stewardship of our air, land, and water, and for the economy of the state. Nevada Gold Mines employs more than 7,000 people across the state with a contractor base of more than 3,500. Among those thousands are countless engineers, environmentalists, scientists, outdoors people, hydrologists, habitat and wildlife biologists, just to name a few. In reviewing this committee's agenda, this committee will not hear from those people. Instead, you will hear a lot of very loud, well-intentioned advocates fueled by money provided by those who prioritize their extreme ide ideologies over the actual Nevada-based users of the, the state's public land. This simply isn't how we as a company are used to doing business. We are used to serious interactions with the professionals you employ, NDEP, DCNR, and NDOM. It is to this state's great credit that session after session, the legislature has been able to reject the fringe ideas presented by an increasingly vocal minority. I hope that today's agenda is an outlier and not a reflection that this is going to change. Thank you for your time. And as always, Nevada Gold Mines and the rest of Nevada's mining industry are here as a resource and a partner for the entire state. Thank you so much. Okay, hey, thank you, BPS. Do we have anyone else on the phones? We have one additional caller, Chair. Let me go ahead and cue them up. Caller, please proceed. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning. My name is Allison Anderson. I'm the Community and Government Relations Manager at I-80 Gold. I'm calling in today in support of Nevada's current regulatory environment. I-80 is a Nevada-based mining company. Our corporate office is in Reno with operating sites all the way from Golconda to Eureka. We are not a huge operation, but we employ about 115 people to do our work and we are hoping to grow significantly over the next few years. Today's agenda is concerning to our company. It gives a platform to those who so frequently use their time making intentionally harmful proposals, often with the stated goal of ending hard rock mining in this state. And it is dangerous to send this signal to our Nevada miners. Nevada has a long held gold standard in the United States for both environmental regulation and mineral development. 
Nevada's system ensures mine operators can protect the safety of the natural resources in our care, as well as the safety of our employees. Miners are a firm believer in the multiple use doctrine. The state of Nevada is 70 million acres of land and that staggering size allows for the industrial users like miners and ranchers to conduct life sustaining business while ensuring more than enough space for people across the state to enjoy the scenic, cultural and amazing qualities of Nevada's rugged landscape. This multiple use balance has been key to the state's success in becoming a hard rock mining destination and a recreational destination, a place to take in the awe of our natural resources and a place to meet the career demands of hardworking Nevadans. However, we must give credit where credit is due. The Nevada legislature has done a good job rejecting the proposals from fringe elements and out of state based efforts to topple the multiple use balance. At I-80, we are confident you will continue to do so, and we will remain your partner in providing information to help you make thoughtful decisions about natural resources in our state. Thank you for your service and for your time today. Thank you so much. We're now going to go back to Carson City. And a reminder as well, please say ditto if another speaker has already shared what you said. It is... We're 30 minutes in. I really want to get people safely on their way, and we'll have less time for presentations today um, as our public comment goes on. And we will have another chance for public comment at the end of day. So just as a reminder, please say ditto if someone's already shared what you'd like. Thank you. Hi. Uh, good morning. I'm Kathy Smith, SMITH. Um, I'm speaking today regarding the uh, Wildlife Commission Agenda Item 12. Uh, these commissioners basically serve as liaisons between the public and the department to make decisions regarding the social aspects of wildlife management. The department presents the biological science while the commission makes decisions on that data after taking the social concerns into account. Decisions to have a hunt, weapons used, seasons, etc. Due to the strong bias of the majority of the nine members, decisions can be reliably predicted to favor hunters and trappers. Even more importantly, by having such a myopic view, they are not only limiting participation in meetings because of futility, but are they, they are preventing the department from branching out to new potential funding sources. There are many options that aren't even pursued because of the capture of an agency that virtually excludes the non-hunting public. With the current requirements, there's a very biased assumption that consumptive users are more knowledgeable about wildlife than non-consumptive users. This idea is antiquated and inaccurate. In close, please study this commission more thoroughly. Being more inclusive with multiple perspectives will better align this commission with the attitudes of all Nevadans. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Next speaker in Carson City. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Craig Smith, S-M-I-T-H. Um, I'm here to speak in favor of the current situation. I would like to clarify something that you heard from a prior speaker. Um, there are nine members on the board, five of which, and I'm going to quote this from the website, if you don't mind, five members who during, the le during at least three of the four years immediately preceding their appointment hel held a resident license to fish or hunt or both in Nevada. That's the only qualification. I'm not a fisherman, but I buy a fishing license to support wildlife. Everyone could or should do that. I would question how those folks are supporting the wildlife by not buying a hunting or fishing license. Um, further, I would like to state that the funding source for the Department of Wildlife is 95% from, and I'll quote here again from their website, if you don't mind, user-derived funds. That's user-derived funds. Okay, that can mean a lot of things, and it does. It comes from sportsmen's groups, donations, auctions, matching federal funding, Pittman-Roberts funding. These are all related to sportsmen's groups. That's their only funding. So they deserve to have more representation on the Wildlife Commission, if you ask me. It's just my, my opinion, but it makes sense that if they pay for something, they should have a voice in what they're doing. Um, that's all I had. Thank you, Madam. Thank you so much. We can take one more speaker down in Carson City and then we're going to return to the phones. Hi, good morning. My name is Tina Mudd for the record, M-U-D-D. -D. I'm the resource manager for Granite Construction Company and I'm testifying on item number 10. 
Granite is both a construction company and an aggregate mining company that employs more than 500 people in Nevada. Granite is proud to build Nevada's critical infrastructure in line with our main core values, one of which is sustainability. On that note, Granite is supportive of the Nevada Division of Minerals and the Commission on Mineral, Mineral Resources, who is responsible for assisting and oversight of the exploration and production of minerals in Nevada. It is critical to safe and environmentally sound exploration and production to retain members that are educated and aware of the complexities of the activities required to keep Nevada at the forefront of the nation's sustainable resource extraction. The industry has worked tirelessly with various commissions, regulatory bureaus, and universities to develop regulations that are at the forefront of balancing the resource needs of the nation and the environmental protection of our great state in which we all live and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to go to the phones. BPS, next caller. Thank you, Chair, to provide public comment. Please press star nine on your phone now to take your place in the queue. Hello. Caller, please, please proceed. proceed. Hi, I, I, I'm not sure if uh, if you can hear me. Um, yes, can hear we me? can. Please proceed. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I would like to make a comment about um, the review of the Na uh, Nevada Department of Wildlife. The current Nevada Department of Wildlife is undemocratic, inept, and uneducated. The members of NDOW demonstrate their contempt and cruelty toward Nevada wildlife. And this is a clearly one-sided corrupt state agency. As one of the first thousand veterinarians licensed in the state of Nevada, their frankly depraved agenda of animal cruelty is unacceptable. Multiple attempts to speak with members of the board and stop horrific animal cruelty, such as uh, killing contests, are met with a bunch of uneducated, self-absorbed, special interest minority members pontificating about their life experiences, which are not relevant or informed. This state agency regularly colludes with local law enforcement to harass citizens who speak up about obvious animal cruelty. This should be very disconcerting to you that citizens are being harassed by local law enforcement and game wardens in residential areas. There's no poaching, yet targeted harassment and civil rights violations of people, of communities wanting to coexist with local wildlife and oppose the cruelty that is NDAO. As a Nevadan, I own guns, ammo, and a boat, which provide revenue to NDOW. Nevada's wildlife belongs to all of Nevada residents, and the legislator has to look at the scam of an agency and conduct a thorough investigation. This must be done by an independent commission and not NDOW or their cronies utilized in the past, such as Professor, Professor Sedinger at UNR. This has to be an independent review. 97% of the, uh, or the vast majority of Nevadans want change. Endow represents 3% of Nevadans. I'm uniquely qualified to point out animal cruelty as a veterinarian. This agency is beyond despicable and unacceptable to our wildlife. I'm sure most of you people listening have companion animals, and this vile and unacceptable cruelty to wildlife has to stop. It is time to evolve, educate, and to do better. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would just um, remind all of our visitors who are speaking today that we treat everyone with dignity, whether it's a state agency, whether it's a member, whether it's another speaker here today. We, we treat all of each other with respect. Thank you for the call. We'll take one more from broadcast and then see if there's anyone else in Vegas as well. Thank you, Chair. Once again, to provide public comment, please press star nine on your phone now to take your place in the queue. Chair, our public line is open and working. However, there are no additional callers at this time. Thank you so much. I see everyone in Las Vegas understands the safety concerns up in Northern Nevada, but is there anyone else I, I should ask who would like to speak in Southern Nevada at the moment? 
Seeing no one rushing to the table and knowing we have another opportunity at public comment at the end, I will return to Northern Nevada and see if there's anyone else who'd like to speak. I clearly probably need glasses and can't tell as well from the screen, but is there anyone seated at the table? And if so, please proceed. There no, is no not. one. Oh, sorry. There is nobody at the table. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. With that, I am going to move on to our next agenda item and thank everyone so much for keeping their comments to two minutes. Um, our next agenda item, number three, is the approval of minutes for the meeting on February 29th, 2024. Committee members, you should have all received the minutes and had time to review them. Are there any questions or concerns from the committee? Okay. Seeing no comments, um, do I have a motion to approve the minutes of February 29th, 2024? Thank you, Senator Goakachia. He just made the motion. Um, do we have a second? Second. We have a second from Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod, and, and I appreciate everyone because everyone's jumping in. Are there any comments or questions on the motion? Wonderful. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Any opposed? Nay. Aye. 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 The motion passes, and the easiest part of this meeting has now passed us by. And thank you all as well so much, because I appreciate the many passionate opinions that are coming out of everyone who's both here in Southern Nevada and Northern Nevada, as well as over the phones today. So thank you very much. Um, we had planned to make an appointment of members to the Subcommittee on Public Lands. We had received a nomination from the, an appointment from the Inter Intertribal Council of Nevada, and we had planned to proceed with that. And just this morning found out that the very qualified candidate that they had selected to serve as the tribal representative um, withdrew his name. So we are going to hold on that until the May meeting where we will then make an appointment of a member to the subcommittee on public lands to represent our tribal community. With that said, we are going to move on to number five on the agenda. And while we are sad to share that Director Scolari is out ill today, we are going to go ahead and hear from Denise Baronio, and I apologize if I, so much if I'm mispronouncing your name, the Administrator of the Division of Outdoor Recreation, and she's here to join us in Las Vegas today. Please, whenever you're ready, introduce yourself for the record, and please proceed. Good morning, Denise Baronio, for the record. Um, thank you for having me here today. I am the administrator for the Nevada Division of Outdoor Recreation, and today I'd like to share with you the impacts of outdoor recreation across the state of Nevada. The mission of the Nevada Division of Outdoor Recreation is to advance and promote sustainable, world-class outdoor recreation opportunities throughout the state. When coming up with a unique way to brand our division, we decided to incorporate Governor Lombardo's catchphrase and came up with our own new motto, which is play the Nevada way, which really exudes the lifestyle of almost 60% of the residents in our state. So who is Endor? We are a small team of five, but we pack a really big punch. Each team member has an outdoor recreation specialty that brings a unique perspective on how we assist with OREC management and implementation across the state. Endor works tirelessly to be the liaison between planning, outdoor infrastructure, the public, and funding. We are a collaborative partner with counties and communities to create cohesive planning for outdoor recreation that has positive, exponential impacts on people and businesses who are drawn to Nevada for its outdoor recreation opportunities. The Nevada Off-Highway Vehicle Program has been housed under Endor at the discretion of the DCNR director until recently, though the position of the OHV program manager has become vacant, and Endor has jumped in as the interim management team until a new personnel can be hired. We also have a new GIS mapping analyst position that oversees the daily administration of the Nevada Trail Finder website. The GIS mapping analyst is now a temporary part of Endor, 
And as a team member, she seeks to, we also want to create a new position for her. Um, she's currently temporary within Endor. We want to create a new position for her that would require increasing our budget to accommodate this invaluable team member. She has been such an incredible resource for the state and federal agencies to coordinate mapping efforts, trail and asset management, as well as specialty and drone operations. The Nevada Trail Finder website is a planning tool to assist users in finding their next trail journey, whether it be on a bike, a hike, an OHV, or a kayak, Nevada Trail Finder is a one-stop shop for statewide trails. And it is also an asset management tool for all land managers across the state. We work every week to communicate with state parks, BLM, U.S. Forest Service, National Park Service, and counties and agencies to collaborate on removing social trails, adding in legitimate trails and providing mapping to assets such as bathrooms, parking, and trash receptacles. The messaging that is at the very forefront of every outdoor recreation effort that Endor participates in is conservation and stewardship. This is actually one of the benefits of outdoor recreation. So as you know, with outdoor recreation, the responsibility of promoting and educating the public about conservation and stewardship is at the forefront. Nevada is the seventh largest uh, state in the nation in sheer landmass with 110,000 square miles and 70 million acres of land, of which 80% is public land. Therefore, it is really our duty to make sure preservation leads the narrative in outdoor recreation endeavors. The Nevada Outdoor Education and Recreation Grant, also known as the NOAA Grant, provides funding for the next two biennia at $250,000 a year for, edu for educational programs to youth K through 12. And in addition to that, um, we really promote education through conservation and stewardship at that level and also promote benefits of mental and physical health that can be gained from spending time outside. The continued growth of outdoor recreation is driving folks to Nevada for a quality of life they may not find in other states. OREC is growing rapidly and is a driver for creating economic vitality to communities and increasing the need for OREC-related businesses across the state. In an effort to help promote quality of life through outdoor recreation for residents of Nevada, Endor has been working with several counties and cities to create outdoor recreation strategic plans. We have strived to help communities elevate their specialized areas of outdoor recreation and take it to the next level of planning. Uh, both White Pine counties and Douglas counties have implemented strategic plans to incorporate walkable, safe trails and connectivity to safer routes for schools and amenities that may otherwise require motorized transportation. Additionally, we have encouraged counties to engage in a shared stewardship agreement similar to the state's shared stewardship agreement. So for reference, the Nevada Shared Stewardship Agreement uh, commits states and federal agencies to expand our working relationships and jointly set priorities and implement projects at an appropriate scale, co-manage risk, and to also share resources. We have shared this concept with communities to show them better ways to be efficient with their efforts while sharing funding and their own resources. This has been such a huge success at the state level, so Endor just wants to expand this concept to other agencies planning outdoor recreational developments. One of Endor's main functions is to connect the dots between projects, planning, and funding, and so the mini shared stewardship agreement that we've proposed is a really great guideline to do that. Uh, one of the funding sources we have utilized to assist with infrastructure and planning are the monies from the EDA grants that we have received through Travel Nevada. They have assisted with grants for Tahoe Meadows Project up on Mount Rose. The initial funding for our Outdoor Recreation Infrastructure Grant, also known as the NORI Grant, and funding to develop an economic impact study on outdoor recreation for the entire state. Uh, we have also been working with UNR to develop a degree path in outdoor recreation management and leadership. Two programs are currently underway to be launched in the fall for a minor degree and a certification in outdoor recreation. And to kind of round that effort out, just last week we were able to submit an earmark request for $3 million to Senator Rosen's and Cortez Masto's offices in um, an event to hopefully take that funding to the next degree uh, level. Uh, another opportunity that we provide to rural communities is the Outdoor Recreation Roundtable Toolkit. Um, this is another level to help communities build an economic um, vitality around outdoor recreation, but focuses really on just rural areas. Uh, Nevada, I am proudly to say, is number one in the nation for ORR's use of that recreation toolkit. 
Um, this map shows all of the areas across the state that Endor and the OHP OHV program gave funding to um, implement outdoor recreation in every single county. We have awarded almost 70 grants across uh, the state for projects, including the Nori grant, which awarded $616,000, including two projects that created this really great collaboration effort of assets and connectivity between the city of Ely and the Ely Shoshone tribe. The NOAA grant has completed its first round of grant awards for a total of $250,000 and covered all 17 counties. And the OHV program awarded 30 grants in the last year for about $2.2 million for projects like the $600,000 staging area in Tonopah, and that included parking, bathrooms, and shade structures. So this sounds like a lot of outdoor recreation. <laughs> and so circling back to educating the public on conservation and stewardship, how do we get out the message to not overlove our outdoor recreation spaces? Um, outdoor recreation, according to the Bureau of Economic Analysis, is now a $1.1 trillion industry. Um, and the pandemic gave people a new leash on life in the outdoors, and that is here to stay. These are pictures of before and after in Zephyr Cove last 4th of July. So clearly the messaging and joint efforts between agencies needs to be much stronger so we can avoid um, that kind of a scene. Endor works on a regular basis with different departments and NGOs all over the state to figure out ways to have better messaging and preserve quality of life for our residents and wildlife, as well as preservation of cultural and historic areas. The Endor team um, sits on many boards and participates in collaborative efforts to find ways to push out shared ideas, promotions, educational series, and curriculum to schools to foster ideas around stewardship with outdoor recreation. We work with the Tahoe Destination Stewardship Program, Travel Nevada, Endow, U.S. Forest Service, NDF, State Parks, and National Park Services, among others, to elevate messaging about needs, safety, and joint stewardship through our social media channels. Um, quarterly newsletters, or by participating in events with other agencies where it makes sense. We are also engaged in strategic planning efforts for both BLM and U.S. Forest Service in their outdoor recreation strategic plans. Endor has many priorities, but these are a few of the highlighted areas. Uh, through the development of the Outdoor Education and Recreation Grant created with AB 164, the legislature also created an outdoor education advisory working group. Thank you, Chair Pazina, for serving on that. The working group is strategizing to find ways to incorporate outdoor recreation into the curriculum requirements for public schools to promote physical activity, mental well-being, and outdoor learning spaces for teachers to also utilize. And there are numerous projects that we continue with the shared stewardship agreement, such as a summit that I attended in Clark County, for different ways to promote outdoor recreation outside of the Lake Mead area. The statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation plan, also known as the SCORP, is um, just starting in phase two for the second SCORP. Uh, we continue to work with National Park Service and state parks to develop the next SCORP for our state that is required in accordance with the Land and Water Conservation Fund. The newest trail finder project that we are working on is building an OREC business and asset profile for every city and county in the state that will provide a list of services on our free website to allow users to discover ways to find their needs in every location. Uh, we recently finished the RFP for the economic impact analysis to be completed. We are in the committee review stages this week for two bids that we received, and we hope to have a hired contractor by June to complete the study within the next eight to 10 months to share with the state. Um, Endor is currently also um, working with um, our PIOs to promote and build a website. We are on the DCNR's um, website currently just as a landing page, and we are awarded some money in the last budget um, to create our own website, so that is up and coming as well. So thank you for your time today. Any questions? Thank you so much, Administrator. This was really interesting, and I'm always fascinated by outdoor education, outdoor recreation. I'm, there's such a great tie-in with Travel Nevada. I was disappointed that Director Scaleri couldn't be here alongside you because I, you've both worked together so well. And looking at the state we were in for tourism, it was a really challenging time, obviously, during the pandemic. So having just such beautiful outdoor parks and recreation, just so much going on. I think it really helped our state from that perspective. Do we have any questions?
Um, I do believe we have a question from Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod. Thank you, and thank you so much for being here. I was just curious um, if you mentioned it. I, I'm sorry I missed it. I'm having terrible allergies, so I'm like, ugh. But um, the Dark Skies Initiative, um, could you talk about that briefly? Denise Peronio, for the record, thank you for that question. Um, the Dark Skies Initiative is still at the forefront. Um, I know that was kind of a focus um, at the, the last hearing, and so I didn't bring that up, but we are still working on that. We have recently had some NAC request changes to take the international starry sky designation out of the requirement for state designation and put that on our plates um, to make it easier for communities to request to Starry Sky designation in Nevada. Um, maybe they won't have the international designation, and it's a really laborious and costly uh, process to do the Starry Skies designation on an international level. So we're getting um, that changed, uh, hopefully, in, in this next legislative session to make it easier to create Starry Sky designated areas in the state. Thank you so much. Senator Gokachia. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I realize uh, uh, Denise, this is re isn't really yours, but the OHV Commission, and I'd like some numbers maybe on, we, we all know, especially with the huge influx, of, especially the side, side by sides are very comfortable. Everybody in the world's got one out there now anymore. The registration of those, we all know they register them when they buy them because that's the only way you can get the title, but I'd like to see what percentage of them are renewed the following year or following three years. I think you'll see there's a huge hole out in rural Nevada, there's, and I know it's an enforcement issue, but we're going to have to catch up on that. You've got 2.2 million you talked about in grants. It should be three times that or more. And that's the only way we're really going to catch up is they've got to have a sticker or tag on them. So if you want to respond, but otherwise I'd like to see some numbers on that. And if it is increasing, we've been promised forever, but I don't think it's, re yeah, there's an increase because there's a lot more new ones, but we're not following up. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Denise Baronio, for the record, thank you for that comment. Um, actually, I agree with you. Um, one of the BDR concepts that was proposed by um, Nikhil, who's the former program manager recently, um, hopefully it will go forward, was to create a three-year registration sticker um, to kind of help alleviate and mitigate the challenge that you're referring to. Um, and we are working to streamline some of the processes. Elizabeth Johnson, who is our deputy administrator for the Nevada Division of Outdoor Recreation, has really Really jumped in and done a great job uh, starting to oversee the grant program for OHV and we are going to be streamlining processes and hopefully hiring one additional person to the OHV program. It's been a one-man show for uh, five years for the most part and so that's created challenges I think and so hopefully streamlining that process and getting in a second uh, employee will help with that. We also have Director Settlemeyer at the table and I think he wanted to take a crack at that question as well, answering that question. Thank you, Madam Chair. James Settlemeyer, Director of the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Uh, we will get that answer to the committee and to you, Senator Gokachia, on the number of renewals. We'll probably have to reach back and ask Nakiel to help out with some of that data. Uh, he used to be the former head of the OHV Commission. However, he realized an opportunity to take an advancement, and he now is now with uh, State Parks, or I'm sorry, uh, Forestry. And in that respect, we'll try to fill that position as soon as possible. We'll get the numbers of that were issued and the, also the issue of number of renewals. I think last year you guys did pass the concept of a three-year permit. There is an additional desire, I think, from the commission in the past and from the industry to have a discussion potentially about letting the registration be online for those to make it easier for people to acquire or at the dealerships. Some type of a discussion with that. I know we've always had discussions of that with the DMV as well, trying to be involved. We'll try to get those numbers to you as soon as possible on that. But as you know, Senator Gokchia, if somebody keeps it completely on their property, they don't have to register it, just so you know. Was that a question, uh, Director Settlemeyer? Yes, uh, uh, clearly, uh, ag, if it's a vehicle used in agriculture, it does not have to be registered, but that's, that's not what's happening out there, and, and you know it and I do, but I appreciate that, and I'm looking forward to the numbers, uh, Director Settlemeyer. I, I think we'll all be surprised at how big a hole there is out there. I know it's there, you do too, the, they register them 
when they when they get them to get their title and that's it thank you thank you so much senator gokachia i believe that vice chair anderson also had a question Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. On slide five, you had mentioned um, the UNR Outdoor Recreation Degree Program. I was wondering if there's been any discussion at all with any of our community colleges for an AA in that, uh, since there are more community colleges available in the rural area, or if it's only through the UNR Outdoor Recreation Degree Program. Denise Peronio, for the record, that's a great question. And yes, uh, the um, initial outreach is with UNR because the original degree program was housed at Sierra Nevada University up in Incline Village. And um, with the, um, when UNR acquired that college campus, the degree was going to be um, removed. And so we jumped in uh, to try and save some aspect of that program. It was a major under environmental sciences. Um, the goal would be to expand it to UNLV um, with a different kind of um, degree opportunity, maybe in guiding and hospitality through business management, um, and then expand that to all of the colleges. I would love to see um, some sort of AA degree in outdoor recreation, more certifications. We have zero degree opportunities in the entire state for outdoor recreation, um, but every surrounding state to us does have outdoor recreation degrees. So um, this was, we felt really a historical opportunity to close that gap um, and the workforce gap as well, which we know is a challenge. Great, thank you so much and thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Do we have any other questions? Okay, in Northern Nevada. All right. Seeing no other questions at this time, we thank you so much for your presentation, Administrator. We really enjoyed it. And that will bring us to item number six on our agenda, a presentation on management of wildlife and mineral resources. First up, we're going to have a presentation from Jennifer Schultz, Program Principal in the Environment, Energy, and Transportation Program with the National Conference of State Legislators. Hello, everyone. I will just get my screen shared here. Okay. Uh, good morning. My name is Jennifer Schultz, S-C-H-U-L-T-Z. I am a program principal in NCSL's Environment, Energy, and Transportation Program. I've been with NCSL for over 10 years, uh, based in our Denver office, um, but I'm joining you today from uh, Vermont, where I now live. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, the National Conference of State Legislatures is a trusted bipartisan organization serving legislators and staff for nearly 50 years. Our constituents number 7,386 legislators and 30,000 staff. We promote policy innovation, create opportunities for lawmakers to share knowledge, and ensure state legislatures have a strong, cohesive voice in the federal system. I will turn now to the topic of the day, Western State Wildlife Commissions uh, is first. This slide shows the name and statutory authority for wildlife commissions in 11 Western states, and these will be my focus today. For some context though, almost every state has a wildlife commission. The four that do not are Minnesota, New York, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, but all of the others do. The commissions range in size from five to 11 voting members. Arizona and California have five. There's a large group at seven, as you can see. Nevada and Washington have nine, and Colorado has 11. In all of these states, members are appointed by the governor. In Arizona, Nevada, and Utah, the governor receives nominations for appointments from a separate nominating committee or advisory board. Senate confirmation is required in 10 out of 11, um, Nevada being the state where it is not, um, from my interpretation. Term lengths range from three to six years among these states. 
and three of the states have term limits. In Colorado and Idaho, uh, members are prevented from serving more than two terms, and in Utah, there's a limit of one term. Here are some common uh, selection criteria that governors must or are encouraged to consider when making appointments to wildlife commission commissions. Uh, I'll start with knowledge. All states require some level of understanding of the subject matter. The laws do not specify any degree being required. Several states require only general knowledge. For example, Idaho law states that no person will be appointed a member of the commission without being well informed upon and interested in the subject of wildlife conservation and restoration. Others are more detailed. Uh, Oregon passed a bill last year that adds a requirement that members understand the roles of federally recognized Indian tribes and the relationships they have with lands, water, and natural resources that the commission governs. That's the language. Um, and Utah requires that at least one member of the board represent each of four listed areas of expertise, which are wildlife management or biology, habitat management, business, including knowledge of private land issues, and economics. Those are just a few examples. Um, experience is a big factor in many states. Membership on Colorado's commission is largely based on occupation um, and hobbies. Three members must be sports persons, one an outfitter, who have obtained a hunting or fishing license for at least the prior three years. Three members must be actively involved in production agriculture. Another three members must be regular outdoor enthusiasts and utilize park resources. One of those must represent a nonprofit that advocates for these issues. The remaining two members, to get to 11 are appointed from the public at large. Uh, Nevada also lists particular experience required as I'm sure uh, the committee is aware. Political party, five states have limits on the number of members from the same political party, Arizona, Colorado, Idaho, New Mexico, and Wyoming. It varies by state, of course. Um, Arizona, no more than three out of five can be from the same party. In Colorado, the language is there cannot be a difference of more than one person between the parties. In Idaho, no more than four out of seven can be from the same party, the same in New Mexico. And Wyoming, not more than 75% from the same party. Uh, on the other hand, Montana's governor must make appointments without regard to political affiliation and solely for the wise management of fish, wildlife, and related recreational resources of the state. Related to this, Idaho and Washington do not allow members to hold any other elective or appointive office at the state, county, or municipal level. Idaho is the only state of the 11 that specifically requires commissioners to be citizens of the United States. Members must also be residents of the state, as in many others, and residents of the region from which the person is appointed. This goes hand in hand with geographical diversity on the categories that I created, as many states ensure this by appointing members from specific counties or regions. In Idaho, Montana, Oregon, and Wyoming, this is the dominant structure for selecting members. The number of regions or district is equal to the total number of members, and one member must be appointed from each. In Oregon, it's two members for some regions. And here are a few other examples of that. Um, in Arizona, no two members may be residents of the same county. Colorado requires at least four members from west of the Continental Divide. And Washington ensures an even split on either side of the Cascade Mountains, and also that no two members may be from the same county. And then I also noted some other criteria as I was looking through these uh, statutes. Um, criminal history and conflict of interest. Nevada is the only state of the 11 that lists criminal history as selection criteria. 
And California and New Mexico are the only two that mention a conflict of interest anywhere. Moving on to meeting requirements, this chart summarizes them. Colorado, Montana, and Utah don't put any number on it um, as often as necessary or whatever is sufficient. California must get together um, at California commissioners at least eight times per year, and it goes down from there. Six in Oregon, five in Idaho, four in Arizona and Washington, at least one per year in New Mexico and Wyoming. And uh, Nevada is the only state in the West with a maximum number of meetings in statute at nine. Most commissions can meet anywhere except Colorado, where two per year must be held west of the Continental Divide, and Oregon, where at least one per year is held in each congressional district. Uh, and my final category quorum, uh, that's generally a majority of members or not specified. Uh, I thought you might be interested in some recent state legislation. At least six Western states have considered changes to wildlife commissions since 2020. I included just one to two examples on the slide uh, from each of those states. A few highlights. Montana added two members in 2021, going from five to seven, and moved from selection criteria around legislative districts to administrative regions. Legislation was pocket vetoed in New Mexico last year. House Bill 184 would have allowed the Legislative Council to appoint members and made it more difficult for members to be removed. A commissioner could not be removed except for incompetence, neglect of duty, or malfeasance in office. Uh, I mentioned the Oregon bill at the start of my presentation that added those knowledge areas. Um, and then last year, Washington considered creating a nominating committee like some of the other states have done and increasing compensation for members. So that concludes my review of Western State Wildlife Commissions. I was also asked to speak about Mineral Resource Commissions. I wasn't able to go um, very in depth on this topic, but hopefully the next two slides will serve as a sort of introduction to your discussions. I found at least seven Western states with a mining board or commission. Those are California, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, Utah, Oregon, and Wyoming. The structure of the first four are on this slide, um, and then the, the other three are on the next slide. Some of the same themes as with the wildlife commissions, there are a range of five to 11 members. Seven is, is the most popular. Most of the members are appointed by the governor and confirmed by the Senate, but not all. In Colorado and New Mexico, the governor appoints five out of seven and two out of seven, respectively. The others are made members by virtue of holding a certain position. Nevada commissioners are not confirmed by the Senate based on my reading of the law. Term length is universally four years for all of these and meetings are held four times per year or not specified with the exception of Colorado where meetings occur every month. And here's a look at those uh, last three in alphabetical order. I did submit a handout to staff. I'm not sure if you received that today or, or if it's coming later, um, but again, I uh, submitted that and all of the statutory language and, and all the details are found in there for your reference. Okay, and that is it. Thank you so much, Ms. Schultz. And the reason we wanted to ask for your expertise and to have NCSL present was because we felt it was important with so many passionate views to have a nonpartisan presentation sharing what other states around the country, especially in the West, have been doing in regards to both of these commissions. So that said, do we have any questions from the committee? 
Okay, I don't see anything it, here in the south, in the north. Do we yes, have any questions? Yes, okay. Chair. Uh, Assemblyman MacArthur. Uh, DeLong. Or excuse me. DeLong. <laughs> Apparently, I'm living in an alternate reality. Um, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I do have a question regarding um, minerals commissions. Did you do any research with regards to what the duties or scope of uh, jurisdiction for each of the commissions was? Because just in looking at these, some of these commissions have very different scopes than Nevada. And did you, did you look at that at all? Uh, that is not information that I pulled on my first go through, um, but I'd be happy to do a more thorough review of those um, and share information uh, offline. Thank you very much. That's it, Chair. Thank you so much, Assemblyman. And if you wouldn't mind sharing that with the committee as a whole, we would love to receive that information. Do we have any other questions? Okay, not seeing any further questions. Thank you so much for your presentation. We really enjoyed it. And that will bring us to our next item on the agenda, which is item number, let's see, item number seven, the presentation from the Committee on Mineral Resources. Um, we'll hear directly from commissions and their corresponding state agencies. First, we are going to hear from Robert, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing this. Um, Giglieri, Administrator of Nevada's Division of Minerals, thank you so much for joining us in Las Vegas, as well as Commissioners Bob Felder and Stephanie Hallinan from the Commission on Mineral Resources, and they'll be joining us in Carson City. Please go ahead whenever you're ready and introduce yourself for the record. I believe Rob Galeri is going first, but I'm Thank you, Chair. I'm Robert Felder, F-E-L-D-E-R. And I'm Stephanie Hallinan, H-A-L-L-I-N-A-N. Thank you very much for having us. <coughs> okay, Rob Galeri for the record, R-O-B-G-H-I-G-L-I-E-R-I. -I, -I. I think Goikachia Center, Goikachia may have the only one worse than mine right now. <coughs> So good morning and hello. My name is Rob Galeri. I'm the administrator for the Nevada Division of Minerals. In coordination with a few commission members in Carson City, we'll be reviewing the request by the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Natural Resources to review the Commission on Mineral Resources. The items requested from the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Natural Resources to review the Commission are listed on this page. There was no request made to discuss the Division of Minerals and the numerous aspects of the programs that the agency manages. It is hard enough to review just the requests on the Commission of Minerals Resources, let alone the activities and programs under the purview of the Division of Minerals in 15 minutes. So we have provided supplemental material for you guys to review along the initial request, and we'll do our best to keep this within 15 minutes. So first, the powers and the duties of the Commission. These are outlined in NRS 513.063. They are to keep themselves informed and interested in the entire field of legislation administered charged to the Division of Minerals. Report to the Governor, the Mining Oversight and Accountability Commission, or MOAC, and the Legislature on all matters which deem pertinent to the Division, any concerning any specific matters previously requested by the Governor or MOAC, advise and make recommendations to the Governor, MOAC, and the Legislature concerning the policy of this state relating to minerals formulate the administrative policies of the division, adopt regulations necessary to carry out the duties of the commission and the division. Every industry within the state has a state agency representing them one aspect or another, and we are representing the minerals industry. The commission has the ability to make recommendations to the governor, MOAC, and the legislature, but if they recommend any statute change, it would require a BDR and approval from the legislature and governor. All meetings are public, and any administrative code changes would require the proper procedures, including multiple opportunities for public comment and input. As noted on the previous slide, the commission is required to formulate and adopt the regulations to carry out the duties of the division. Below are the NRSs associated with the commission and the division of minerals. First, 
I want to make this clear. We do not permit mining in Nevada. We provide data and statistics on mining, but we do not permit mining. NRS 513 establishes the Commission, the Division of Minerals, and the Abandoned Mine Lands Program, where we've been identifying and securing historic abandoned mines and the hazards since 1989, which has resulted in one of the largest and best hard rock AML physical safety programs in the nation. And we've received two national awards for projects completed in the last five years. And it also establishes our mineral education co program. <coughs> NRS 517, it requires the division to maintain a standard set of mining claim forms and work with the counties to standardize the forms with their needs. And this is definitely the oldest statute that we have any uh, coordination with, considering it was put in place in 1897. NRS 519A creates the Reclamation Performance Bond Pool Program and gives industry an opportunity to bond with the Division of Minerals up to $3 million per participant before any work is completed on the ground and implement implements a premium to manage our bond pool. Our bond pool program is relatively small compared to the $3.3 billion in mining reclamation bonds held between the BLM and NDEP right now. NRS 522 gives us division the regulatory authority to permit oil and gas drilling within the state with the focus of the drill well integrity and respects to human and wildlife, health and safety, and protections of freshwaters aquifers. NRS 534 gives the same authority but for geothermal drilling. And all permits are shared with NDAO, DWR, and NDEP before any approval. NRS 534B is our most recent regulation. This gives the Division of Minerals Regulatory Authority to permit expiration activities on dissolved mineral resources, aka lithium brine resources. Drilling and testing up to five acre feet per project of water before requiring a water right and converting to a water well driller at DRI, or DWR. All projects all production is with NDEP of lithium. We are only exploration, and all surface disturbance on federal lands is with the BLM or the Forest Service. Okay, the composition qualifications background of the commission. So under NRS 513.023, the commissions are all governor appointed with seven members. Two of them are familiar with large scale mining. One person familiar with the production of oil and gas. One person familiar with exploration and development of minerals one person familiar with the situation unique to small-scale mining and prospecting, one familiar with geothermal, and one member to represent the general public. The terms are within four years. It's important to have this variety of commissioners cover all the aspects of the minerals industry, including federal fluid minerals. Each commissioner has a unique background with di different education experiences, covering all facets of the minerals industry, including environmental and reclamation. The appointment process for a commissioner. <clears throat> Upon the end of a term or resignment, the chair of the commission will notify the governor's office. At that point in time, they will put their, that opportunity on the governor's office website for chairs and commissions. Any member of the public that meets the requirements of the vacant commissioner is eligible to apply. Then the governor will review the list of candidates and use their discretion to appoint the candidate. Next, I'll be handing it off to uh, Bob Felder in Carson City. Thanks, Rob. Robert Felder, uh, for the record. Um, so the commission leadership is defined by statute, and our commissioners represent a significant amount of experience for the division to call upon. Uh, in particular, I think one of the things that's most important that we do is we regulate oil and gas and fluid minerals well designs. Rob mentioned this, but I think it's worth mentioning twice that, you know, in ensuring the safety and isolation of the aquifers and the groundwater of Nevada. Uh, we also provide guidance on current mining and exploration trends that assists the agency with budgeting based on how much uh, claim fee revenue we think we're going to receive year after year. You know, that's quite variable. As we know, mining is quite uh, cyclic, so we have to do some forward looking on that. Um, Rob mentioned the members and their expertise. Uh, we do have seven commissioners. You have some supplemental materials with their biographies. Uh, again, a broad range of educational background, engineering, metallurgy, business, geoscience, and in particular worth mentioning expertise in environmental regulations and reclamation. One of our large-scale mining commissioners, Stephanie, who's sitting next to me, is the environmental superintendent for a large mining company. So we have, you know, a wide range of expertise, including on the environmental side. Uh, our meetings and our voting rules and our quorum are also defined by statute. We meet 
usually, we're required to meet four, every four months. We usually meet at least four times a year and often more than that because of special meetings that come up every now and then. We meet in various urban and rural locations across the state. Uh, and all of our meetings are open to the public and meet public meeting law. And I'll now pass this back over to Rob. Again, Rob Galeri for the record. Sorry about that, uh, Rob. I was a little behind on your slides there, but I caught us back up. Okay, next I'm going to go into a brief CMR history. So this request was made to talk about the legislative history for the Division of Minerals, and that it ended up me creating a 20-something page report on the legislative history, and we will not go through that in detail, so I'll try to do the best I can to summarize that in a short period of time. So the roots of the division and the commission can be tracked to 1943 when the legislature established advisory mining board. Then as now, it's members who are trained and experienced and qualified in the operations of the mining industry and state and completely conversant with its problems are appointed by the governor. The purpose of the board was to study the ways and means of furthering mining industry of the state, further explore and develop the oil and gas industry, report results such studies to the governor, report its recommendations for the legislature deemed necessary to further the mining industry of the state, and call upon the Bureau of Mines and Geology and its analytical lab laboratory in furthering the objectives of purchase er, and purpose of this legislative act. In 1953, an act uh, for pro the prohibition of the waste of oil and gas within the state of Nevada created the Nevada Oil and Gas Conservation Commission and developed NRS 522. Due to the lack of funding and permanent staff of the Advisory Mining Board in 1977, the legislature determined that the best representation of the minerals industry was needed. It was then combined with the Oil and Gas Commission with the, and the Advisory Mining Board to create the Oil, Gas, and Mining Board to serve as advisory capacity for the newly created Division of Minerals within the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. This addition of minerals into DCNR was done at the same time that Division of Environmental Protection was taken from Health and Human Services to DCNR. The act also established a department level of energy within the Division of Call Water Resources and a Division of Water Planning. In 1983, AB 350, or 335 changed the regulatory authority for energy and minerals, and the division left DCNR and created the Department of Minerals, supervised by the Commission on Mineral Resources, with all the authority and duties as they are the same today. In 1993, again, sweeping departmental changes happened with the creation of business and industries. A lot of state agencies were merged underneath of that department. This only lasted six years when the legislature recognized the importance of mining, oil, gas, and geothermal within the state moved the division for the last time as it became a standalone agency consisting of the Commission of Mineral Resources and the Division of Minerals. I'm going to hand it back off to Stephanie now in Carson City. Thank you, Rob. Stephanie Hallinan again for the record. And thank you for your time today again. So I'm going to just go ahead and read through specifically the mission that the Commission of Mineral Resources um, has on their site and the purpose behind it is to encourage and assist in the responsible exploration for and production of minerals, oil, gas, and geothermal energy, which are economically beneficial to the state to provide for public safety, also for identifying, ranking, and securing dangerous conditions at mines that are no longer operating and collecting and disseminating information on exploration, production, and related topics. And the reason I bring that up and wanted to clearly read the mission statement is the Nevada Division of Minerals has a wealth of information on their website if you've not had a chance to look at it for the education and information for the great state of Nevada regarding all of those industries. So they have done a tremendous job on that. So being part of the commission, as has been stated by both Rob and Bob, we have our quarterly commission meetings and we do additional meetings as needed, and we definitely have the industry experience to help make the decisions and provide the guidance necessary. And then as well, another topic to reiterate about NRS 513, about advising and making recommendations to the governor, Mining Oversight and Accountability Commission, and the legislature concerning the policies for the state relating to minerals for the commission. And just to reiterate that it's for the exploration production of and the interactions of our commission and the division meet the intent of that NRS 513. Next slide, please, Rob. 
So then I'll just touch briefly upon the funding sources for the commission. The average revenue and expenditures for both fiscal years 2022 and 2023, the revenue was 3,424,521. There are no general funds that support this commission. The funding is solely through the Nevada revised statutes that you see listed below there on the slide. The $10 per mining claim on federal land filing fees that are paid to the counties. So that's part of the, that is partly what funds that, along with the $20 per acre disturbance for any new mining or exploration plan of operations on federal lands, and then any of the annual fees associated with that. Then the oil and gas drilling permit and production fees, geothermal drilling permit and annual well fees, also the dissolved minerals drilling permit fees. And then a small portion for the medallions royalties of maybe up to $300 a year based on that for when they mint a new medallion with the state of Nevada logo on it. So there is also that little part that comes in. And then there are some um, portions and partners that come through federal, state, and local government partners. Okay. Next slide, please. And now to just briefly talk about the expenses related to the commission. As maybe you can see on the slide there that the per diem expenses for fiscal year 2022 were around $1,711. And then the stipend expenses for the commission in 2022 were $2,560. And then in 2023, the per diems reduced to about $306. And that was mostly due to the fact that we had a lot of virtual meetings and not everybody travels um, to make the actual meetings themselves. So while each members of our commission are entitled to receive a salary of not more than $80 as fixed by the commission for each day while engaged in the business of the commission. Many of us just appreciate to also make this service as part of our um, caring for the state of Nevada and our industries. So now I'll turn it back over to Rob, thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Again, Rob Galeri for the record. So right now I'm gonna re review some recent actions that were requested. So the most recent action um, or change in statute done by the Commission of Mineral Resources was the creation of NRS 534B. This is dissolved mineral resource regulation. This was due to the fact that there was instances where there was different claim holders of a locatable mineral, which lithium is in areas, yet they did not have water rights. So they did not legally have the ability to drill and test and explore for the lithium within the brine yet there was other people that had all the water rights within that valley. So this was the medium between them to try to allow for exploration to determine if there is a resource. And then at that point in time, they have to go through DWR and the permitting to acquire water rights within the state. Um, this was, again, a, not a unanimous support by industry either. There was opposite sides on both sides of the party. And we found that this was the best guidance at that point in time for the exploration within the state of Nevada. The next one was NRS 522. Hydraulic fracturing regulations were requested by Governor Sandoval. And at that time of placement, these, were the, uh, these regulations were the second most stringent in the United States. In total, only seven hydraulic fracturing permits have been received by the Division of Minerals since then. Two of them expired before drilling happened. Five wells were drilled. All five wells are plugged. <clears throat> the division and the efforts by the commission and the coordination with the Division of Minerals um, is relevant when you looked at when Executive Order 2003-003 was enacted, all the regulations underneath the Division of Minerals had been reviewed and updated within the prior eight years. It took a lot of hard work to define anything to need to up, update and streamline the regulations within the Division of Minerals. The division also does a lot of collaboration and support with other partner agencies. We work closely together with the Nevada Bureau of Mines and Geology on reports and publications. Currently, we are working with them to fund a project to look at lithium resources and potentials in the state of Nevada. That report should be hopefully coming out mid this year. We work with local and state museums. We built a minerals, exp or minerals display in the Las Vegas Valley Museum. We've done it in the Reno Discovery Museum, and we're currently building one for the Nevada State Museum. The one in the State Museum right now is updating the plate tectonics display, which I think was put in place when plate tectonics was a new theory. Um, go ahead and other agencies at the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada, we coordinate with them, DCNR and their NDEP AML program. 
We secured a lot of the historic abandoned mines for the Tonopah Historic Mining Park. We've done work with our abandoned mine lands program, the Fourth Ward School. We work at the University of Nevada, and we bought multiple supplies for Bait Basin College to help develop their resources there. <clears throat> Under the guidance too for the Division of Minerals, as mentioned earlier by Stephanie, the NDOM open data site, which is now used by industry, public, academia, news research journalists, state, federal, and local governments, and many more. This is a new website that has drastically changed the way for people to view, download, comprehend mining, geothermal, oil, gas, multiple land issues, uh, multiple use for land issues, energy right-of-ways, educational materials, and much more data. All of this is free, does not require special software to use and downloadable. The education provided by the division focuses on factual mineral production, employment, taxes, mining, claim law, trends, and most often the information to assist in identifying the correct agency for permitting. Again, we do not permit mining, but we often help guide companies to the right agencies for their permitting needs. This also includes informing companies that, the, that are new to the state to focus early efforts on tribal and community engagement early in the permitting process. While performing classroom presentations, the vast majority of the education focuses on rocks, minerals, geology, geologic timescale, fossils, mineral uses, and most importantly, the Band of Mine Land program. Our Stay Out, Stay Alive campaign is a message that is always focused for the Division of Minerals and any education opportunity we do. It is also not just with the Nevada classrooms. We rather, at a national level, advocate for the passage of the Band of Mine Lands Good Samaritan Law and fully funding the new National Hard Rock AML program. As I mentioned earlier, there are state agencies covering all aspects of industries in Nevada. There's a the Department of Wildlife here today that manages the wildlife for all of Nevada, the Department of Outdoor Recreation, the Division of Forestry encourages proper forest management, health and human services, and countless programs that have covered different healthcare industries, the Gaming Control Board, Department of Agriculture, and many more. Nearly every state agency has an educational aspect incorporated into their goals, and we provide the minerals education and factual data within the state of Nevada. Thank you for your time today, and we are here now available for questions. Thank you so much, Administrator and Commissioners, for the presentation. I believe we have a question in Northern Nevada from Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch. Thank you, Chair, and thank you so much for coming in and presenting to us today. I really appreciated that you mentioned environmental concerns. I think that many of us in the room today um, are very interested in that topic. And I also appreciated that you brought up your mission statement, so I want to tie those together a little bit. In reading your mission statement, I don't see anything explicitly that says environmental or conservation or anything like that. I just wondered if you could speak to um, where that comes in into your mission and what is informing that work that you are doing. Rob, you want Again, to take that Rob one? Galeri for the record. Yep. Thank you, Bob. Um, so what we like to show in the mission statement, the key word there is responsible, right? You look at the history of the mining industry of the past 160 years in the state of Nevada. What happened in the 1800s and early 1900s, even into the 1960s, 70s, and 80s is not what is happening today. When we mean by responsible, we mean by any company that goes by any regulation and needs to engage with the environmental regulations that are now put into place. Um, the 1872 mining law, what it does is allow the ability for a person to locate and have the exclusive rights to minerals on federal lands if it's open. That does not allow them to mine. You still need to go through all the NEPA process, the, uh, any environmental process within the state of Nevada and be a responsible operation within the state of Nevada, which meets all those goals. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. OK. Thank you very much. I believe we have some more questions up in northern Nevada, and then we'll check with our southern Nevada contingent. Um, Assemblyman DeLong, not MacArthur. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's OK, Senator and Chair. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, as I know all the presenters know, I've served on the commission for 16 years and was chair for the latter half of that. So I have a pretty good understanding of how the commission and the division work. Um, I thought it would be useful to provide a little more information with regard to the education side on how the workshops and the work that the commission or the division does on education fits into the curricula required at the schools. Thank you for that, uh, Assemblyman DeLong, through you, Chair Pizzina. 
please go direct and thank you. Thank you. Rob Galeri again for the record. So thank you, uh, Assemblyman DeLong, for that question. So the Division of Minerals works and does a lot of classroom presentations. I believe last year we did over a couple hundred throughout mainly Las Vegas and Washoe County. Uh, one of the things we do as well is we coordinate with the Nevada Mining Association and an earth science teachers workshop to where we actually provide materials to these teachers to get a professional development credit and put together through the core curriculum standards to meet those curriculums so they could do education opportunities within their classes. So they are going to these workshops, getting provided, we provide them with a rock and a mineral box of 12 of each that they get to bring back to each classroom and often provide them extra so they have multiple sets and then have geologic, geology um, type presentations that they're able to actually bring back to their class and meet the core standards of the Nevada curriculum. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Assemblyman Gurr. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for being here today. I was interested in your uh, comments on your funding sources. That is all from the mining industry itself? That's how you fund the entire division? Are they annual fees? <clears throat> Again, Rob Galeri for the record. Uh, thank you for the question, Assemblyman Gurr. So yes, these are all funded through, uh, the main aspects of our funding is that $10 claim fee. So any person that files a claim within the state of Nevada on federal land has to pay two fees. One to the BLM, which is roughly about $165 plus a couple extra fees on top of that. One to the county. The county is anywhere from about 12 to $15. 10 of those dollars is directly dedicated to our agency and it is an annual fee. The rest of those fees are sometimes on a hit or miss basis, like the $20 disturbance is anytime there's new disturbance. So that is not annual. It is very hard to predict a new mine operation going in, so it's hard to predict those. And then the last one is federal funding. So you see we get federal funding as well from the partners like the BLM, but that funding from that program actually is directed through the BLM mining claim fees back to us. So that is actually an opportunity for, again, that the mining industry is completely paying for the agency that we represent. Thank you for that. That was my whole point behind it, was that the uh, mining industry is funding itself for this commission. Thank you. Okay, do we have any questions in Southern Nevada? All right, we don't have any questions right now from the Southern Nevada contingent. So with that, Administrator Galeri and Commissioners Felder and Halladen, thank you so much for the presentation today and you can step back and we are going to move into agenda item number eight. I am all kinds of tickled pink to see how quickly we're going through today's agenda only with sites on wind and snow in Northern Nevada and keeping all of our guests who've come to speak to us today safe as well as staff and members. So agenda item eight, we're going to have a presentation on the Board of Wildlife Commissioners. We'll have Director Alan Janay and the Nevada Departments of Wildlife presenting on the Board of Wildlife Commissioners. Um, I believe that joining Director Janay in Las Vegas are Chair Tommy Cavilia and Commissioner Alana Wise, and I apologize if I mispronounce names yet again. And in Carson City, we have Vice Chair Shane Rogers and Commissioner Paul Young. Please go ahead whenever you're ready and introduce yourselves for the record. Madam Chair and uh, Committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present today. Uh, Tommy Cavilla, that's C-A-V-I-G-L-I-A. I'm the current, current chairman of the commission. We were gonna do some brief introductions of the commissioners in attendance just to kind of give you guys some background on, on, a, on a portion of us. <clears throat> so again, good morning. I'm Tommy Cavilla, current chairman of the Board of Wildlife Commission. I'm in my second term on the commission. I'm a lifelong Nevadan, being raised in Ely, attending college at the University of Nevada, Reno, graduating with a civil engineering degree, and thereafter moving to Las Vegas, where I've lived for the last 20 years. I own a heavy civil construction company down here in Southern Nevada. Separately, I'm also a licensed subguide, and I've held that guiding license consistently for almost 20 years. I'm also a lifetime member of a number of wildlife and habitat-related NGOs, and actively volunteer on projects associated with them. It was actually this volunteer work that created the relationships that ultimately led to my seat on the commission. 
Hello, I'm Commissioner Alana Wise. That's A-L-A-N-A-W-I-S-E. Um, I held the public seat on the commission. Um, a little bit about myself. I am the owner and CEO of a wildlife consulting firm that specializes in assisting construction and development projects and research projects throughout Nevada and the West. Um, I also have a nonprofit associated with getting children into STEM and the trades. Um, I have grown up in Nevada, um, was not born, but definitely raised, um, and have been here uh, throughout my life. I uh, have a bachelor's degree in biology, and uh, I think that is, that's about it. And I think we'd like to offer the opportunity to those attendees up north um, to introduce themselves as well, the commissioners and staff. Thank you. Thank you and uh, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the commission. My name is Shane Rogers and I'm the vice chairman of the Nevada Board of Wildlife Commissioners. I'm a 45 year resident of Las Vegas and I've been volunteering uh, for wildlife conservation uh, throughout Nevada for the past 35 years. I've served on the board of directors for the Fraternity of the Desert Bighorn. I've also served as a treasurer at the Fraternity of the Desert Bighorn, as well as a member of the Board uh, of Trustees for the Fraternity's Endowment. In my professional life, I've been in the banking and financial services industry for the past 30 years and serving in a number of different senior executive and leadership roles. And it's really been my uh, business experience along with my conservation work that has allowed me to really add value to my role as a commissioner uh, for the betterment of wildlife uh, for all Nevadans. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, Members of the Committee, Paul Young, Board of Wildlife Commissioners. Uh, brief background of myself, uh, grew up in Reno, went to Reno High, UNR, go Wolfpack, uh, went to law school um, down in San Diego. Came back, worked uh, as a deputy attorney general under Catherine Cortez Masto when she was there. I was at the Washington County DA's office for a brief stint, and now I work in the government affairs sector. Um, as to um, kind of more of a personal background and, and wildlife background, grew up in Reno, North Nevada, enjoyed fishing the Ruby Marshes, obviously have a lot of opportunities up in Northern Nevada to get out in the wild and camp, um, as well as was on the board of Nevada Bighorns Unlimited for several years. Through that, um, did a lot of water development, um, fundraising, um, uh, habitat restoration, and stuff to that matter. And, and now I'm on the Wildlife Commission, so thank you. Great. Um, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Wanted to make sure camera was shifting to get, get our staff there. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the Commission. My name is Mike Scott. I'm the Deputy Director of Resources for the Nevada Department of Wildlife. Good morning, Chair and Committee. I'm Jordan Gosher. I'm a Deputy Director of Administrative Services for the Nevada Department of Wildlife. All right, thank you. We'll bring it back to Vegas. Um, I am the Director of Wildlife. I'm Alan Janay. Um, I have over 30 years with the agency. Um, and uh, we'll walk through this presentation. Um, I want to just say that uh, we supplied some very wordy slides um, just so that you guys had the, the bulk of the information at your fingertips. Um, as committed through NRS is that I serve as secretary of the commission. Um, I'm a non-voting member. Um, and so I just wanted to disclose that. Um, walking through uh, table of contents, want to give you an overview of what we're going to talk about today. Um, to talk about the commission without the context of Endow would be uh, missing an a integral piece. So I wanted to walk through that. Um, and then I'll walk through uh, the NRSs that guide the Board of Wildlife Commissions. Then I'll present a little bit on the legislative history and end with some recent accomplishments. When you look at the mission of the Department of Wildlife, it remains to protect, conserve, manage, and restore wildlife and its habitat for the aesthetic, scientific, 
educational, recreational, and economic benefits to the citizens of Nevada and the United States and to promote the safety of persons using vessels on waters in Nevada. This is a, a unique um, scenario that many people don't understand is, is that we also have responsibility for boating safety. Um, we often joke that we are the DMV of the sea or Nevada's waters. So. Um, Looking at our uh, agency, we have a very broad statutory charge that has been referenced in some of the public comment received earlier. Uh, we do have responsibility for all Nevada's 900 wildlife species. Uh, we do have Category 1 peace officers who have the responsibility to patrol on public waters, but also have the rights to uh, uh, enforce all Nevada's laws. Nevada is the seventh largest state, um, yet we are one of the five smallest wildlife agencies in the nation. Um, this is quite complex when you consider that 85% of Nevada is public land, and that means that uh, most of the time in order to speak to wildlife issues in the state is, is we have to comment on projects on federal lands. And so that means that often we, most years we're reviewing and commenting on over 600 NEPA projects uh, across the state. Our unique funding model um, in comparison to other state agencies is we are predominantly self-funded, uh, user-derived fees. You, uh, the general fund commits about 2% of our funding for the agency. The other 98% is derived from license and tag fees as well as federal grant uh, systems such as sport fish and wildlife restoration programs. Um, it's really important um, those funds, in order to gain access to them, we need match. That means non-federal state funds that we can take advantage of a three to one match of those. Okay, moving into the Board of Wildlife Commissioners, we wanted to give you an overview of the NRSs that guide them. It's been mentioned earlier today that um, the appointments, there are nine commissioners, um, one conservation, one farming, one ranching, one general public, and five members who, during at least the last three or four years immediately preceding their appointment, held a resident license. Currently, that makeup is from Clark County, two from Clark County, one from Washoe County, one from Lyon, and one from Humboldt. The uh, statutes that describe the commission um, can be found in NRS Title 45, Chapter 501. And uh, as you saw in the introductions, is, um, while the uh, description of who they represent um, is one thing, the backgrounds and the occupations of those individuals uh, are quite variable. Other qualified or other qualifications spelled out in NRS 501-171 is, is that uh, Basically, they have to have a clean wildlife history uh, as far as no wildlife crimes in the past 10 years. No more than three uh, commissioners can come from the same county whose population is greater than 700,000, which in Nevada, that means a whopping one county of Clark County. Um, and then there can be no more than two members from the same county whose population is 100,000, but less than 700,000. Um, that generally means Washoe County. And then no other more than one member may be from the same county whose population is less than 100,000. Um, the commission leadership annually selects a chair and a vice chair. Um, you were both introduced to earlier. And a person shall not serve more than two consecutive terms as chair. When you look at the commission duties and meetings, um, there was an overview earlier um, of the western states, and you've got some of this information, but I'll repeat, is that there are no more than nine meetings. Um, typically, that is seven. Um, in legislative years, uh, we do throw on another meeting to discuss legislative bills. Um, as mentioned earlier, five members constitutes a quorum. The compensation, um, for the commissioners is $80 a day plus per diem. And the duties spelled out are spelled out in NRS 501-181. Um, they're to consider the protection, propagation, restoration, transplanting, introduction, and management of wildlife in this state, the promotion of the safety of persons using vessels, 
promotion and uniformity of laws relating to policies. Additionally, adopting regulations for wildlife management, voting safety, and adopt regulations specific to hunting, trapping, and fishing. When you consider the public process, um, this is what it looks like, uh, is, is that the commission senses, sets it as the central body, um, taking recommendations, biological recommendations from the Department of Wildlife. Um, those are then vetted through county advisory boards. There are 17 across the state. Each county has its own county advisory board. Those members are appointed by county commissioners. Um, and they are one of the input processes. Each county has the opportunity to host public meetings in association with every commission meeting. And so there's a public input process in each county. And then there is a general public process that's uh, provided not only at those uh, county advisory board meetings, but also at the Wildlife Commission meeting itself. The commission then takes that input in the consideration and development of policy and regulations, and then basically creates NRC, NAC, or policy that then guides the department. So looking at uh, the counts or the commission's uh, legislative history, some important dates, uh, there's a lot here, there's a lot more. Um, I'm not gonna go through every one of these, but I think it's important for you to pull out some of the uh, important pieces. When you think about the history of wildlife commissions um, across the United States, is uh, many of them were timed uh, similarly. Um, it was a time when the nation was trying to deal with, trying to get exploitation of wildlife resources under control um, and so you saw this movement towards conservation. And so 1877, um, kind of interesting is, is that first mention of a commissioner was actually a fish commissioner. Um, and they were actually trying to get more food on the table for the citizens of the state. Um, probably the most significant date on this uh, list is 1937. That was when the Pittman-Robertson Federal Aid and Wildlife Restoration Act passed um, with a key senator, Key Pittman, actually from a state of Nevada. That legislation passed. That basically generated this federal funding source um, that I talk about when, when I say we're looking to get state match to go get $3 of federal funds. Those are Pittman-Robertson funds. Since uh, 1939, Nevada has received Two hundred ninety-seven uh, million eight hundred fifty-seven three eighty-six. The nation, um, the significance of that bill and what that has done for conservation within the United States is, it, I'll, I'll just summarize and say over twenty-seven billion dollars. Um, it's a pretty significant act um, that really changed the management of wildlife in the United States, and it's been the funding model um, for wildlife agencies across the United States. It also is was one of the things that really shaped the shape and form of the commission uh, because it was derived from a user-based system where tags and license fees at the state level could then be used to match um, this federal funding. You look at 1947, um, association to that is, is that you started to see the implementation both in 1943 and 1947 of Nevada then building uh, regulation and process and structure to actually receive those Pittman-Robertson funds. Um, looking at 1969, um, there's been a discussion as to the membership of the commission. 1969, prior to that, there were 17 commissioners, um, one from each county. In 1969, that was reduced to nine. Um, in 1989, um, the Wildlife Commission was then expanded from seven to nine with two additional sportsman rep representation. Um, and just, I think it's, it's really important to look at the notable mentions is that uh, the Wildlife Commission has received Commission of the Year from Wafwa um, both in 1984, 2003, 2016. Um, uh, a significant piece is that Tiffany East um, in 2020 was our first female chairwoman. And um, 
one of the things that's that's pertinent is is in this discussion of funding models is there is a been an effort to try to contemplate a more comprehensive funding system for wildlife um, in the United States and it started with a blue ribbon panel and now has moved on to an act called Recovering America's Wildlife Act and notably is as Nevada's Wildlife Commission was actually the first commission that endorsed that uh, that process so now moving on to recent accomplishments I've laid out a few um, I think when most people think of and when you are part of this is that you see that the commission, um, the majority of the tasks that they do are based on regulation of harvest. Um, it's a very important component of wildlife management is, is that you have scientifically justified, well-regulated harvest of uh, animals. And so when you look at it, is, is the majority of their work is, is actually generating 98% of the funding for the agency through the harvest of 11% of the species of the of this state. Um, but looking at some of the diversity of things that they deal with, you can look at CGR 506, which was a permit of possession. Um, this was derived out of Senate Bill 125 out of the 2020 session. Um, a, a common occurrence is as they go through the fishing regulations and try to simplify um, and try to get more people outdoors. Uh, most recently, as reflected by minerals, uh, we went through an executive order, NAC simplification and cleanup, um, but we had actually gone through that process within the last two years before that even came out. So it was a, it was a rather simple process. Um, additionally, the commission uh, is, is dedicated and has a commitment to fair chase within the harvest, the legal harvest and well-regulated harvest of animals. Um, they've addressed things like trail camera restrictions, sighting and caliber restrictions, and revised uh, provisions around commercial collection of reptiles, which was there for a while a little bit out of control. Additionally, they've evaluated and commented on habitat fragmentation and anthropogenic impacts um, through things such as comments on the military base expansions that you all are familiar with, both here in Nellis and uh, up north with Fallon. Um, they've also provided comment on land transfers, such as the Wine Cub Gamble land transfer in Elko County. Um, and they're well aware and have viewed and toured uh, energy development sites that uh, we seem to be the nation's leader in solar uh, development. Um, down here in Clark County, you're only too aware of it. Additionally, the Commission supports and funds uh, protection of habitats. Um, and, and conservation easements. Uh, recent examples are the Pole Canyon Conservation Easement in the East Humboldt Range, um, uh, actually a sage grouse uh, conservation easement in Desert Creek uh, near Smith Valley. Additionally, um, we recently acquired a ranch called the Licking Ranch and established a new uh, wildlife management area called the Argena WMA. Um, it is near Battle Mountain, Nevada. And then also some property that we purchased um, near Cave Lake in Ely. Additionally, I'd like to add that the Commission annually evaluates and approves funding of nearly $2 million um, that, that is coming through the heritage process as well as the duck and upland fees. Those projects um, collectively we can use, those are great sources of non-federal match. And so each of those projects in those $2 million annually can go towards matching. That gets us access to $6 million in grants. So again, looking at this, um, I wanted to give a, a good overview of what the, the commission does, their background, what they do. And I hope I've achieved that and given you some thoughts of the bigger issues that they also consider. And I thank you for the opportunity to present, and I'll pass it to the chairman. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, Tommy Cavilla again, uh, ch uh, chairman of the Board of Wildlife Commissioners. Uh, I would like to thank the department and Director Janae for putting together that presentation. To add, to, to add a little to what Director Janae just presented, I would like to note that the current commission consists of nine individuals from across the state, all with varying perspectives, backgrounds, expertise, and life experiences that when combined become extremely valuable to the overall commission decision-making process. One other item that I'd like to note 
is that I believe for the most part, the public perception of the Wildlife Commission is that we solely focus on hunting and fishing rules, regulations, and quotas. However, the major component that I personally believe is often overlooked is the focus both the commission and especially the department places on wildlife habitats, specifically habitat restoration for all species across the state. Just one of those programs that the commission oversees is the distribution of heritage of the heritage grant program. This program has infused millions of dollars into habitat improvement projects throughout the state that not only help game species, but ultimately help all 895 species throughout the state. Another ma major issue across the West for all species is, wild, is future land use. The department continues to keep us informed of the various land use issues and associate, associated potential wildlife and habitat impacts. Over the years, if deemed warranted, the commission has taken formal position statements on some of these issues. And I wanna thank you again for the opportunity to present today and we are open for questions. Okay, thank you so much. Do we have any questions in the South? All right, Senator Gokachia. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and, and I guess uh, I'm old enough to, to remember back pre-69 when those commissioners were in fact appointed from local government. And in fact, I was, I hate to say it, but I, I had a legal hunting and fishing license at that point. I was old enough. So, but, you know, sometimes be careful what you ask for with the change. You know, I think that change, I look at back at those people in, that were in White Pine County, Eureka County, Elko County, that actually served as wildlife commissioners and were county appoint, appointees. And, and, boy, they had their heart in the right place when it came to wildlife and habitat. And so... Be careful what you ask for when you're looking for change because sometimes it goes down the wrong path. I think we were better served in the 60s when those people like Art Bialy and Isidore Serra and those guys were sitting on, on those wildlife commissions. They truly had wildlife and the habitat. Not that the present commission doesn't, but again, there wasn't near the argument. They were appointed by a local government. So thank you, just a comment. Thank you so much, Senator. And I think we're going to go to the north and we can come back to the south. Um, Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch. Thank you, Chair. And thank you for being here to talk to us about these issues today. I noticed in public comment and also this presentation, the term science back policy was used several times, which I appreciated. And I just wondered if you could speak to the source of that science. Are there biologists or um, environmental geographers on the commission? Or if there aren't scientists with that expertise on the commission, are there some on staff that are informing the commission? Where is that science coming into the process? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, for the record, Alan Janae. Um, so while I, I think uh, Commissioner Weiss um, in her introduction does, did display her background as uh, having a degree in wildlife management um, or biology is, is that the agency of 260-ish uh, employees, um, there's a very significant portion that are uh, trained wildlife biologists, um, everything from a bachelor's on up to a PhD. Um, there's a lot of wildlife and fishery science, habitat knowledge um, that goes into these decisions. And that information is supplied to the commission um, as relevant topics come up that, that overlap into not only in quotas, um, but also in reintroductions into uh, aquatic invasive species management and dealing with that. There is a uh, high degree of training and also a very long tenure of experience in managing those species that is brought to bear and supplied to the commission in those opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to stay up north for the moment, and I believe Assemblyman DeLong had a question. Thank you, Chair. Um, appreciate the presentation. I appreciate you all coming in and being here. Uh, I think it's quite helpful to have you here. Um, as it relates to the, the funding mechanisms, you had mentioned that uh, with the Pittman-Robertson um, funds, the, st the state has to come up with a basically a 25% match to get the 75% of the dollars for the total budget. Um, what is the composition of the, the match the state provides? Is it all 
uh, dollars, or is there something else that's used to, to come up with that match number? Thank you for the question. Uh, for the record, Alan Janae. Um, so when we talk about those matching uh, dollars, uh, the match that is applied to those federal grants, there are typically three major uh, grants that we deal with. One is the Pittman-Robertson, which is called wildlife restoration. There's a sport fish, sport fish restoration, and there is also a boating excise tax that is also available. And when we look at those is that um, when we're generating the $3 or trying to get the dollar to get to the $3, is that can come in donations. Um, there are multiple NGOs that have been mentioned here today that that provide monetary um, donations to the department, um, but then there's also the in-kind, and that's the volunteer. Um, some of the commissioners here mentioned today their time doing volunteer. Um, I think one of the probably the best examples, two of the best examples we have in this state are water development. Um, it's a program of about $1.2 million. It's developed over 1,700 uh, water developments across the state, artificial water developments. And that is that $1.2 million budget is solely carried. There isn't a state dollar that goes into that. It's all in-kind match and donations from sportsmen's organizations. The other one is, is our uh, uh, hunter education program. We've got a, a army of hunter education uh, instructors that are spread across the state to do hunter education and we use their volunteer time to again match to get the access to those federal dollars. Appreciate the opportunity to give an answer. Uh, Chair, a quick follow up, just a, a comment to characterize what you just said. So we're seeing a number of um, nonprofit organizations, 501c3s that are actually volunteering their time and effort on the ground and that gets counted. Is that what's happening? Yes. To be more clear and concise, absolutely. That's uh, the time, the mileage, okay. and in some cases, the equipment rental um, that those volunteer groups provide gives us a match to get access to the $3. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Assemblyman Gurr. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for being here today. Back early on, there was a conversation, just you touched briefly on it, uh, Director, about the uh, uh, County advisory boards. I spent many years on one in Elko County, and I would just like you to explain how they get appointed, how many members there are, and how the process really works. Because on the ground, in person, that's where people with problems can come and talk to your local representatives. So if you could explain that a little better. Plus, I've got a follow-up, Madam Chair, to that. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, for the record, Alan Janae. Um, and so when we talk about these county advisory boards, as each county has them established, um, again, um, there is constraints um, within NRS that actually explain, you know, what the membership can look like. Um, a board with a population less than 700,000 um, can consist of three to five members. Um, it depends on the county as to what they look like. Um, those that are 700,000 or more, um, can actually be five to seven members, um, which is Clark County singularly. Um, those are, as I mentioned, appointed by the county commission. Um, so as a vacancy comes open, the county commission has the opportunity to select that and fill that seat. Um, they are, as I mentioned, those meetings are held in conjunction and before the, the uh, commission meetings. And so those are the public input processes at the county. Um, for citizens and the public to come forward, hear agenda items that are being considered at the con next commission meeting to provide input that is then brought forward into the commission um, and given that opportunity uh, called out and the commission asks specific specifically for each county's input into the uh, commission agenda. And if there's more that you would like, I can stand for that. You may ask one follow-up question, Assemblyman. Please proceed. Turn my mic off. It has nothing to do with the county advisory boards, although a quick comment would be that if people on the ground in the county would show up to those meetings and have their input, 
it would make a huge impact on what goes forward to the commission. My other follow-up is your uh, habitat programs. I don't think you've explained those enough to what's going on. We've had serious habitat loss over the last 40 years. Eastern Nevada has, especially northeastern Nevada, with the multiple huge range fires, it's amazing we still have populations, and I know that the department's been working hard, so maybe if you could explain some of how you've gone about trying to restore the loss of habitat we've had in northeastern Nevada, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, as the past uh, Habitat Division Administrator for the Department of Wildlife, there's nothing I love more than to talk about habitat, um, and so, uh, one of the biggest threats, one of the biggest conversions, probably one of the most significant environmental issues that are going on in the West and especially in Nevada is the conversion, loss and conversion of sagebrush. Um, in Nevada alone, we've either lost or converted 50% of the sagebrush in the state. Um, that is mostly due to uh, cheatgrass and wildfire cycle. Um, it's as you mentioned, we've seen years that are over a million acres lost. Um, we're fighting to try to, you know, make up for that. And uh, the commission and the department, I look at uh, numbers that go back. I did a consolidation of numbers back in uh, 2018. And uh, we, had, we have put together over $35 million worth of effort um, to try to stay in front of that or reverse that trend. Um, and as I mentioned, we're, we're still losing. And that's, that's small in comparison to what the BLM does. But as a small agency, um, I can look at our accomplishments in habitat restoration, in meadow restoration. Um, you look at that and just since 2017, as we have infected over 644,000 acres of, of restoration across the landscape in Nevada. And again, um, when you contemplate a million acres burning, um, it's, it's tough in one year, but uh, we are doing our part and the commission is funding that, um, as mentioned before, through the Heritage Program and other uh, funding sources along with the NGOs to try to reverse that trend. It is the biggest thing that's that's driving population level consequence in the state. Um, all sagebrush obligates and uh, dependents that occupy that space are all seeing trends. You can look at mule deer numbers, you can look at sage grouse numbers, you can look at pygmy rabbit. The trend in those populations can be very well attributed to the loss of that habitat, that 50% loss or conversion. But I, I greatly appreciate the opportunity. If there's more along that line, I'd stand for that. Thank you for the answer. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I also have a question, which director could be for you or for the chair. Can you please share with us what the what notifications are posted for the general public to know when you, when these um, wildlife on commission meetings are happening, and also if people can attend um, not just in person but also via Zoom and also make public comment that way as well. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I will speak to the, the process um, that the department follows, which is the open meeting law. We follow the open meeting law. We follow the timelines. It's probably the biggest thing that we have in contemplation in preparing for a commission meeting is, is absolutely making sure that the posting of the meeting agenda and those regulations that are being considered are all within the, the compliance of the open meeting law. Beyond that, um, as you saw, we can have up to nine meetings a year. Um, we typically have seven of those that are in rural or uh, urban locations. That means Reno or Las Vegas. Those are well attended or uh, those are open as far as virtual attendance. Um, the other two that go to rurals, it's just a matter of whether or not um, the facility that we're using to host that meeting has the accommodations and has the bandwidth to carry um, a virtual attendance. And so we have been in places while we shop around and we try to find um, those accommodations is um, sometimes we don't want, we, we have been caught in a situation where we thought we had the, 
the internet coverage and then get there and then end up in a sporadic um, opportunity to, to broadcast. And so it's affected the meeting because we're very committed to trying to get that through. And so in, at times where we end up in locations that don't have it, is it isn't available and it's a, you must attend to speak. But most every other, like I say, seven me minimum of seven meetings a year, there is virtual attendance availability. And I'll pass it to the commission. Uh, Tommy Cavillia for the record, record um, Madam Chair. The one other item I'd like to note, it's been the policy of the commission at our meetings when, whenever it's an action item and we take public comment after the initial initial discussion on every action item. So, and, you know, at like, like your meeting today, you have public comment at the beginning, at the end. We actually allow public comment after every single action item. Um, compared to most public meetings I've been to, I we are very uh, liberal in the amount of public comment we had. So the pu the public does get the opportunity to speak on the pro to speak to our process massively. Um, And just one more item that I would also add, um, again, for the record, Alan Janae, is that um, there is a commitment by the commission is, is they don't workshop and adopt in the same meeting. And so they will workshop a meeting or workshop a, a regulation at one meeting and then at the next meeting adopt. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any further questions? Okay. I think that we got most of the masked up in Northern Nevada as well, so I don't see any other hands. So at this point, I think we are good. So thank you so much for presenting this, inv this information to us today. We appreciate it. And with that, we will move on to the next agenda item. All right, I believe that takes us to nine on our agenda, a discussion on mining and mineral resource management in Nevada. And today we will hear from Nikki Bailey Lundahl, the Vice President of External Affairs, joining us in Carson City, along with Kyle Davis from Pinion Public Affairs. Thank you so much for joining us. And please feel free to introduce yourself for the record and present when you're ready. Uh, good morning, Chair Bazina and members of the committee. My name is Nikki Bailey Lundahl. I'm the Vice President of External Affairs for the Nevada Mining Association. Established in 1913, the Nevada Mining Association is the premier trade organization for the entire modern mining industry. At the core of the association are miners, of course, but also included are the professionals and companies that comprise the entire industry from exploration and discovery through construction and operation to closure and reclamation. Nevada's mining industry can be found in every county in this state, whether it's a mining operation or vendor who supplies goods and services. In many Nevada counties, mining is the major industry. The biggest employer, the largest taxpayer, the most philanthropic. In total, the mining industry contributes $4.6 billion to the state's GDP and directly employs more than 15,000 Nevadas, Nevadans in good-paying jobs with strong benefits. And most importantly, it produces the metals and minerals necessary for Nevada's homes, cars, and devices, now and in the future. Of the 20 elements currently produced in Nevada, the federal government has designated four as being critically important to meet the country's goals for clean energy production. Nevada mining is, most strictly, is the most strictly regulated industry in this state, and a network of federal and state agencies oversee every aspect of the mining process. Operating on less than 1% of Nevada's land mass, the industry is subject to the rules and regulations of the BLM, the U.S. Forest Service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the U.S. Mine Safety and Health Administration, the Nevada Depart Division of Wild Department of Wildlife, the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection, the Nevada Division of Water Resources, and others. The Nevada Division of Minerals, NDOM for short, is an important part of that regulatory network. As the administrator explained earlier, NDOM has a critical role in the exploration process and the oversight of fluid minerals, such as geothermal and brine-based lithium. Yet the agency does not receive a single dime in general fund dollars. In addition to the oversight of certain mining operations, the Nevada Commission on Minerals, and by extension NDOM, provides critical services to the mining industry and to Nevada in general. NRS 513073 requires the Commission and NDOM to encourage and assist in the exploration for minerals in Nevada. Thus, the agency provides an important first point of contact for any person or company who wants to explore for minerals in the state. 
NDOM staff explain the rules governing exploration and provides access to important scientific data. As the administrator explained, NDOM offers an open-ended website that draws from mining-related public records, including those held by BLM and the Forest Service, and provides a compilation that is not available anywhere else. It's important to the industry, of course, but it's also important to Nevadans as a trustworthy source of mining information. NRS 513-063 requires the commission and NDOM to advise the governor and the legislature on mineral policy. This requirement means that you have a neutral source for information, best practices, and recommendations. The Nevada Mining Association will always offer its perspective, of course, and is willing to share mining-related information. But the statutes require the commission and NDOM to collect huge amounts of data and share it with you so that you have a trustworthy and you have trustworthy and accurate information from which to make decisions that are critical to Nevada's future. The Commission on Mineral Resources and NDOM are critical elements of Nevada's mining regulatory system, one of which is the most robust in the world. Other states and country, countries look to Nevada as a model for balancing economic productivity with environmental sensibility. Without this important agency, the system would, not have, would have significant gaps. The, mining, the Nevada Mining Association might not always agree with NDOM, but we do not have any recommendations for changes in, in their structure at this time. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Kyle Davis, and I appear today on behalf of the Nevada Mining Association. As you just heard from Ms. Bailey Lindahl, the Nevada Mining Association is the tr premier traded organization for the entire mining industry. I have the privilege of handling the environmental affairs for the industry. As I'm sure many of you are aware, there are a host of laws and regulations governing the mining industry on the federal, state, and local levels. Today, I would like to walk you through a brief description of the laws and regulations that mine operators are responsible for complying with. The average mine takes seven to 10 years to permit before a single shovel of dirt is moved. Many mines take more time than this, very few take less. The most recent project in Nevada to receive a record of decision from the Bureau of Land Management took over 12 years, and that's before construction has even commenced. Most of the time to develop a mine is spent in permitting. The construction phase generally only takes about one to two years. The, this entire process from discovery to opening is governed by state and federal law. Once the mine is opened, all operations are governed by state and federal law. Finally, the process for mine closure and reclamation is governed by state and federal law. You can start to see why mining is, in Nevada is the most regulated industrial process in this state. So what does all of this look like? All of the different parts of the mine development process are governed by different government agencies. The filing of claims and exploration for minerals is governed by the Nevada Division of Minerals and the Bureau of Land Management or the U.S. Forest Service. Once a potentially economic de deposit is identified, environmental review is commenced through the National Environmental Policy Act. This process allows for vigorous public involvement along with involvement from other cooperating agencies which can include state and local governments. Through this process, potential impacts to Nevada's air, land, water, and wildlife are identified, and plans are developed to avoid, minimize, and mitigate these impacts. One example of this is the conservation credit system through the Nevada Sagebrush Ecosystem Program. This is a sophisticated state-based program that accurately accounts for the impacts to sagebrush habitat and prescribes appropriate mitigation strategies. The NEPA process also requires community engagement and government-to-government -government consultation between the federal agencies and local tribes. There's also a process to account for potential cultural resources. All in all, the mine permitting process allows for significant public involvement, significant analysis of potential environmental impacts, and significant procedures to avoid, minimize, or mitigate these impacts. After all of these procedures have been completed, including any legal challenges, a mine may commence, commence construction. As I mentioned before, the construction phase is much shorter than the permitting phase. During this process and throughout the life of the mine, an operator must obtain permits from the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection for any potential impacts to air, land, or water. Any violations of the terms of these permits are punished by penalties that range from fines to shutting down entire operations. Luckily, this rarely happens as mine operators in Nevada take great care to ensure that they are operating within the terms of their permits. 
If the plan of operation for a mine changes, the operator must go through all of the same processes that I already outlined, complete with robust public involvement. At the end of a mine life, every operator must have a plan for closure that must be completed before a single shovel of dirt is moved on the site. This plan must ensure a productive post-mine use for all land on a mine site and must be approved by the Division of Environmental Protection. The state and or the federal agencies hold bonding to ensure that this reclamation takes place in the event of a default by a mine operator. The state currently holds over $3.5 billion in bonding to ensure this. All in all, the regulatory structure for mining is extensive, robust, and comprehensive. Nevada has the highest standards for mining reclamation of, and re regulation of any jurisdiction in the country and the world. And this is done through a number of regulatory agencies, including the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection, the Nevada Division of Minerals, the Nevada Division of Water Resources, the Sagebrush Ecosystem Program, the Bureau of Land Management, the U.S. Forest Service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and many, many others. Other jurisdictions look to Nevada as the gold standard for how to regulate mining right. Nevada miners are proud of their record of producing the minerals necessary for our daily lives in an envi environmentally responsible manner. Thank you for your time. We'd be ha happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for the presentation. Do we have any questions here in Southern Nevada? Okay. What about in Northern Nevada? Do we have any questions up there? Okay, I don't see anyone jumping in with, oh, Actually, I'll, I'll jump Vice in. Chair Anderson. Thank you. Uh, so thank you so much for the presentation. Um, as you mentioned, so many regulatory bodies. Are there any that are also done at the county level or are they all at the state and federal level uh, based upon just how large some of these are? Are any of our counties ever involved in these discussions as well? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Through you to Assemblywoman Anderson, Kyle Davis, again, for the record. Uh, rarely is... Um, Davis, you can go direct. Thank you, thank you Madam Chair. Uh, most of the regulations do exist at the state and federal level, um, but to the extent that a mine operation is located on private land within, uh, within a county, then there would be, um, there would be local government involvement, uh, potential special use permits or other, uh, other, other things like that. Um, and obviously, um, all mine operations very much want to work uh, with those local governments to make sure that the operations, even if it's not required by law or regulation, that they're doing things in a way that, um, you know, that is benefiting the local community. Thank you so much. May I have a follow-up? Yes. Thank you. Uh, keeping with the county idea, um, how has the mining industry helped different counties across our state, if you've got that information? I'm thinking in particular of our schools. What a surprise for that. Uh, but how often does the mining industry in particular go in to help our schools in different ways of teaching and or and helping with other organizations such as Boys and Girls Club? Uh, thank you for the question, Nikki Bailey Lundahl. Uh, I can uh, compile that information and, uh, and give that to everyone on the committee. We work with the Nevada Division of Minerals for teacher workshops. Uh, our, our, the, our taxes go to directly to fund education within the state, and we have a variety of different programs within each one of the counties of this state um, through Boys and Girls Clubs and other avenues um, to help with education. And Madam Chair, if I could uh, just add one other item, uh, Kyle Davis again for the record. I would also note, and um, um, my colleague here um, noted the uh, philanthropic efforts of the uh, of the mining industry. And if you look at every level of education in Nevada, um, from pre-K all the way through our university system, you'll see dollars from the Nevada mining uh, industry that goes into helping many, many programs in those areas. Thank you so much, and thank you, Chair, for that time. Thank you. We are going to come down to Las Vegas to Assemblywoman Bill, Bay, Bill Bray Axelrod and then back up north to Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch afterwards. Thank you for being here. Um, I was just curious, what is the status with uh, Nevada Superfund sites? Um, how many do we currently have and what is what's going on with those and where are they? 
Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, uh, Kyle Davis. Um, Assemblywoman, uh, there is, uh, to my knowledge, and I looked this up a few days ago, uh, one Superfund site in Nevada, um, and it is the Carson River area, and that is uh, historic uh, from the mining area of, uh, of the Comstock back in the 1800s. Uh, other than that, and certainly um, modern mining practices uh, have many safeguards built in so that this the, so a situation like that doesn't happen again so uh the only the only site that we have is is from historic practices back in the 1800s Chair, do you Assembly want me? Woman LaRue Hatch. I was, I was waiting for my turn, so here we go. <laughs> um, thank you, Chair, and thank you for coming in today. My question is along the lines of reclamation. I think you mentioned that a mine can't open unless there is a plan for it to close, and I just wondered if you could speak to um, either the regulations or the standard practice for what it has to be returned to. Does it have to be exactly as it was before the mine was open? Does it just mean that someone has to be able to use it, like they could put up a parking lot and then it's good? What does the reclamation process look like? Uh, thank you, someone. Uh, Kyle Davis, for the record. Um, I don't have the regulation in front of me, so I couldn't tell you exactly the various, uh, all of the, of the different pieces of this. This is all outlined in regulation uh, with the, uh, the Bureau, or the, the Bureau of uh, Mining Rec Regulation Reclamation, um, where they outline all, all the entire process of what a, um, what a reclamation plan must include. The standard is a productive post mine use. And so that in some cases that is revegetating the area and making it look very similar to the way it was before. In some cases that may be something to where um, what, what we're seeing a lot lately is the idea that some of these, because a lot of our mining mine sites already have energy transmission going to them for operating the site, that we're seeing this as a very attractive place for renewable energy development uh, after the, the mine is, uh, is closed. So that's one example of something that could be done uh, in, a, in a reclamation plan to where that would be a product, productive post mine use, even if it doesn't look exactly like it did um, prior to mining starting. Thank you. And Chair, may I have just a quick follow-up? Yes, thank you. So I think that helps shed a little bit of light on there. When you use the word productive, is there a definition? Could it be economically productive? Or does it have to be productive for the environment? Is it up to interpretation? How is that word being interpreted? Uh, thank you, Assemblyman and Kyle Davis, for the record. Um, without having the uh, the regulation directly in front of me, I, I don't want to answer with complete certainty, but my understanding is this is the word that exists in the regulation and it is, uh, it is something that is, that is enforced in that process. Um, and realistically, it's probably a question that's better, uh, better for, the, uh, for the Bureau to uh, answer rather than me. Thank you, sorry to test your knowledge of all the regulations this morning. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. Do we have any further questions? I would ask Mr. Davis if you have an opportunity to take a look at that regulation later and connect with the Bureau. Maybe they could get back to us afterwards or you could follow up with the committee afterwards. That would be wonderful. Absolutely, I'd be happy to. Uh, Chair, just a quick right. point on along that, uh, Assemblyman DeLong here. Um, if you we're going to get information to the committee. I think it would be advisable since most mining in Nevada occurs on public land that we get uh, uh, 43 CFR uh, 3809 um, in, included in that package because that drives a lot of what that post mining land use looks like. Yes, absolutely. Okay, with that, not seeing any further questions. Thank you so much for the presentation today. We very much appreciated it. And we will move on to the next agenda item. Um, again, thank you so much, Ms. Bailey Lundahl and Mr. Davis. We are going to move to item 10. As a heads up to everyone, all of our guests and visitors here today who have been kind enough to join us and we're looking forward to presentations. After item 10, we are likely going to move into lunch in Northern Nevada and in Southern Nevada. And after half an hour, we will return for item 11. So for item 10, 
This is going to be, again, we have a lot of passionate attendees today, and we thank you all so much for joining us. It's a discussion regarding um, some concerns regarding the Commission on Mineral Resources and the Division of Minerals. And we'll be hearing from John Hatter, the Executive Director of the Great Basin Resource Watch, and from Mina Stevens, Executive Director of the Western Shoshone Defense Project. And I apologize to you both ahead of time if I mispronounced any names. I apologize. Um, we appreciate you joining us today from Carson City. Whenever you're both ready, please proceed. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, my name is John Hatter. I'm the director of uh, Great Basin Resource Watch. And good morning. My name is Fermina Stevens, and I am the director of the Western Shoshone Defense Project. Thank you for having us. We thank you, uh, Chairwoman Pazina, for inviting us to provide you some input on your deliberation regarding the Commission on Minerals and Division of Minerals. <coughs> Here's our, our opening here. Let's see if I can figure this thing out. <coughs> um, <coughs> we are speaking on behalf of our organizations, Great Basin Resource Watch, Western Shoshone Defense Project, as well as the Center for Biological Diversity and the Progressive Leadership Alliance in Nevada, all compiled this, uh, this composition. We represent a broad constitu constituency across rural and urban Nevada, including directly, uh, directly affected peoples. The critical part is who is affected by mining. <clears throat> mining affects Nevada significantly in many ways, changing communities, land, and the water systems for indefinite periods of time. <clears throat> um, we all know some of the benefits of mining. We just heard about that. Some of the things that we have to, at all Nevadans have to grapple with, and water is a big part of it. Many of you heard. Our, um, we introduced a bill last session to deal with this issue of mining pit lakes and the amount of water that would end up in those mining pit lakes and how that they would affect uh, lands around, uh, around Nevada in, for indefinite periods of time to do their draw-in. Another area in which water is affected significantly is in the dewatering process, which is required to keep mining operations dry. As you can see in this map, it shows how far-reaching the dewatering effects are many, many, including many, many miles away from where the, uh, where the groundwater pumping is occurring, and often recovery times um, on the order of decades to hundreds of years. So, uh, oops, we're years to recover. Fermina will... If we're going to protect the future of Nevada, we need to look at all angles and effects of mineral extraction. Negative effects, including those to the natural and spiritual landscapes, are significant to the Shoshone people. For instance, the White Cliffs at Mount Denebo is significant because this place that used to be a place of prayer is no longer used due to the damage and degradation that mineral extraction has caused. As our elder, now ancestor, Joyce McDade stated, how can we pray to our creator when the place is being blown up, unquote. This place of prayer has been ruined, it is damaged, it cannot be reversed, it is forever. Other directly affected communities are also affected, such as our friends, neighbors, and the ranchers near Mount Hope, near central Nevada. They also have significant concerns. Their concerns of toxic dust, drainage, toxic smoke, traffic, noise, and the lack of water has the potential to damage their livelihood. This warrants recognition. As you now know, the negative effects are real, they are significant, and they must be taken into consideration if we want our great state of Nevada to remain healthy for all living things to thrive. So our first point, commission, on the composition of the Commission of Mineral Resources. So it's necessary that Nevada have oversight bodies to deliberate on policies and regulations needed to ensure the safe and least damaging operation of mines. The Commission on Mineral Resources is one of these oversight bodies with responsibilities that involve some technical aspects of mining, but also mineral policies which affects all, which affects all Nevadans in some way or another, most of whom derive no income from the mineral industry. The Commission needs to be able to discuss in a just way regarding policy and regulations without conflict of interest. The Commission does address technical aspects of mining, and so we agree that some representation on the Commission with mining background or people connected to the mineral industry is useful and needed. At the same time, the Commission can always call on staff from the Division of Minerals to clarify technical aspects. 
We currently view the composition of the commission as unbalanced and virtu with virtually all members whose income is either directly or indirectly connected to the mineral industry. So we have the following recommendation. Our recommendations are that the commission should have rep representation from directly affected communities. The majority of seats on the commission are not held by people who derive their income directly or indirectly from the mineral industry. That there be at least two indigenous seats, the most affected peoples. The two non-indigenous affected community people, two seats for the non-indigenous affected community people. And there can be up to three mineral derived income seats with technical expertise. Appointments are to be made in the same manner as the Mining Oversight and Accountability Commission, NRS 514A040. Our second perspective, <clears throat> the Commission and the Division should not advocate on behalf of the mineral industry. NRS 513073 explicitly states that the due duty of the Division of Minerals and by extension the Commission as an oversight body is to promote and facilitate mineral exploration. The division is a regulatory agency on well drilling, oil and gas, dissolved minerals, and to some extent reclamation. A fundamental regulatory principle requires that the agency that is regulating a business or activity should also not be advocating on its behalf <coughs> of that business or activity. We feel like this violates neutrality and, is, and that is needed in, in an agency. So our second recommendation is that 5013073 be amended to remove the following duty, encourage and assist in the exploration for and production of oil and gas, geothermal energy, and minerals in the state. We will, I will note that uh, assist is, is, assist maybe is something that is a useful for the industry to understand, but it's really the encouragement part that we're concerned about <coughs> as a conflict of interest. And our third point around is, is related to public education. The Division of Minerals has an educational component, as you've heard today. The, the duty seems to align with the directive to promote mineral exploration. As outlined in uh, NRS 513043, the phrase, quote, educate persons engaging in those enterprises and benefit those enterprises. This would seem to require tailing educational materials for the mineral industry and to benefit the minerals industry. We find this to be unacceptable which results in educational information that in our view lacks balance. The division has an entire web page dedicated to general mining education under the title All About Mining. That includes resources for educators, as you've already heard about today. In this regard, it is very important that the information provide the, soul, the full scope of consequences of mining. In reviewing the educational materials, it is clear that the damaging, aspects of, uh, uh, damaging effects of mining are not completely represented or some perspectives are not present at all. For example, acid, acid mine drainage. This is a severe problem at mine sites and including in Nevada, surprisingly enough. For example, the uh, Phoenix mine, which is shown here, is, has an acid mine drainage situation which will go on indefinitely, require inter intergenerational management. Um, these kinds of issues are not, are not, are not well addressed in the education program. Also, the fact that there are severely affected uh, pit lakes in Nevada as a result of, uh, of mining, and we don't know when they're actually going to get cleaned up, even though most of them are probably not as bad as this one for sure. So these are some of the effects. Also, there's uh, uh, indigenous, uh, indigenous perspectives seem to be also missing. It is also... It is also important in these changing times that we find balance in educating the public in all aspects of mineral extraction. The protection of natural laws, land, air, water, and sun is important because as stated by Carrie Dan, when these are gone, we are walking toward a spiritual death, unquote. This is true for all of humanity. And in the words of Joe Kennedy, had there been meaningful consultation and valuation of indigenous perspectives on these projects, we would not see losses of biodiversity, cultural landscapes, water, and air pollution that we see today, unquote. As an indigenous peoples, we have knowledge and understanding that some do not comprehend. But if you open your minds and listen, you will recognize that we are not the problem. We are the solution to many of the extremes we are witnessing today. An entire 
group of people's culture, traditions, and spirituality is in jeopardy due to damages caused by mineral extraction. And this is not shared in any of the public information. Yes, the reality is difficult to address, but together we must find and maintain balance. As lawmakers in a state where mineral extraction is expected to increase, it is time to acknowledge, protect, and respect God's given laws, land, air, water, and sun, so all beings can live healthily into the future. So if the division is to provide information on educational materials on the mineral industry, then it must provide the full range of consequences, good and bad. <clears throat> this is another reason to have a more balanced representation on the commission. So to remedy this, we have two, op we have two options we thought of. Um, one is when we look at NRS 513 Section 2, which is the Collect and Disseminate Clause in the, in the NRS, to completely eliminate that. Um, so if we did that, the, di the division would have no educational responsibility. This means that much of the information that it does gather that's non-educational, just informative, uh, will have to be housed el elsewhere. Option, option number two, B, would be to rephrase uh, to the uh, section two to say collect and disseminate throughout the state information regarding all aspects and consequences of mineral exploration and extraction. So in this way, it puts an emphasis on the need to require, uh, to seek out all sources of information. This option would allow the division to consider much of its information gathering as it has been doing, but also require the division to represent all consequences and damage is done, and reaching out to people and entities in addition to the, mine, the Meta Mining Association, UNR Mining Faculty, USGS, et cetera. This will be needed, we think, to establish, to fulfill this charge. Um, we think that um, the, the commissioners and division has been operating under the NRS the way they're supposed to. We're not criticizing what they've been doing in a sense, but we think that the NRS needs to change so that their responsibilities change. So we thank you very much for your time, and we have, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to address uh, at this time. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. I believe we do have a question up north from Assemblyman DeLong. Thank you, Chair. I actually have a couple of questions on two different topics that they've presented on. But thank you for your presentation. Appreciate it. Um, first, as it relates to the uh, education, um, we heard from the division that the curricula they develop and present in the schools meets the core curricula that's required for, um, for K through 12 education. Um, and so I, I guess you're suggesting they put other things into that. Have you reached out to the division to suggest what might go into that? For the record, John, John Hatter, uh, thank you for the question. Um, not necessarily suggesting that they put other things into the division. I mean, I think that there, is, uh, there are components of the, of the curriculum that, the, uh, that are being met. Um, the question is, are they getting, how is it being presented? Um, we have not, at this point, had a discussion with the division. We're happy to do that. But we feel as though um, if the NRS is changed in such a way that helps to reinforce um, the, the division to seek out alternative points of view, I think that would be helpful. Um, they, have the, they have a lot of resources at their disposal to do so, um, and a lot of affected peoples don't. So I, just to follow up on that, um, I think reaching out to the division probably would be the most effective way rather than trying to get the legislature to revise a statute to try and change the curricula. Um, as it relates to the, um, the commission composition itself, uh, your presentation implies that um, the commission shouldn't be um, advocating uh, for the mining industry. Um, are you suggesting that all commissions that the state has, whether it be a commission related to, to gaming or to energy or to wildlife, um, shouldn't be advocating to the, for those industries, or are you just singling out mining? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, 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 Representative DeLong. Um, I mean, essentially our point is that if we have an agency that supposedly has a regulatory duty, then it should not be advocating for it. So that would not just apply to the mineral industry, in my view. Um, and the commission sort of follows from that. 
uh, just as a follow-up, then I'd love to see your proposals for all the other commissions. And there's plenty of people you can talk to about that. Thank you so, so much for answering those questions. Do we have any questions in Las Vegas? Okay, Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod. Thank you again for being here. I'm just curious, are there um, still communities that um, it's recommended to be on bottled water? I know um, near Yearington, that was an issue a few years back, and I'm just curious if we had other communities that were still suffering. Uh, good morning. Thank you for your question. Um, Fermina Stevens here for the record. Um, I believe the community of McDermott is currently on water restrictions, and I believe their their water table is um, is lowering quite severely. Thank you. Okay, I believe Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch had a question. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for presenting on this today. So looking at the recommendations for the changes in the commission, I'm looking at recommendation one, adding uh, seats for two indigenous representatives, I wondered if you could speak to how, or to what extent is the commission currently working with indigenous communities, and to what extent is that voice currently being represented on that commission? You want to start? To my knowledge, um, I don't know that they reach out at all. And so I could be wrong, but I have not heard of that happening. And for the record, John Hatter, I mean, certainly there's no representation on the commission itself. There are no indigenous rep or voices on the, on the commission. <clears throat> and that's a key, I think, aspect is that they be in a place, uh, in the place of, of, of uh, decision making and policy making. Thank you. I'm so sorry, Chair. Is there anybody from the commission that could possibly also answer that question as they might have a little bit more That was more what I was about to ask sorry, right Chair. now of someone from the commission. No worries. Thank you so much. We, great minds think alike. Is someone from the commission on minerals still present who could answer that for us? Wonderful. We have someone coming to the table in Las Vegas as well right now. Thank you, Chair. Bob Felder for the, uh, for the record. Uh, I'm not aware of recent um, interactions with Native Americans and indigenous people. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen. I'd like to ask Rob, although he's not on the commission, but he's very aware of the communications that have gone on. Rob. Again, Rob Galeri for the record. So with the Commission Mineral Resources, right, um, there has been minimal interaction recently due to the fact that we don't regulate mining in any aspect. The most recent interactions directly were when we were developing the hydraulic fracturing regulations, and there was direct interactions because of the locality during that time of putting those regulations in and the locations that the wells were being proposed to be hydraulic fractured. So there was tribal engagement during that time, as well as all commission meetings are public meetings, open for public comment, and always open for tribal to give, come, and present to us. And like I said earlier in my presentation, um, it's a part of the Biden-Harris administration on all mining moving forward that there's early engagement in tribal communication with any mining operation. We continue to advocate for that. Anytime there's a new company that spends the time to sit down with the division or the commission, we advocate early and often to communicate with tribal and local communities first, um, as well as with the federal land managers and state land managers. Thank you both so much. And, and I would definitely ask that, you know, some of our tribal members who've come forward, if you have the opportunity to have those conversations, please do. I, I think that's so important. Um, if there's nothing else, Assemblyman Gurr, I believe you had a question. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> this is a question for Mr. Hatter. Last session, uh, you were talking about pit lakes. It seems to me that you have a pretty good familiarity with large-scale mining. And in that capacity, because you are, have you ever applied for the Mining Commission? John Hatter, for the record. 
Um, no, I haven't. I, uh, actually, I would assume that it would it might be seen as a conflict of interest um, in some ways uh, with the communities that we work with because the fact that the commission has a role of promoting the industry. We try to enter. We try to enter into communities as a, as a nonpartisan, as a uh, public interest group. Um, so I assume that there could be complications along those lines. So, so I never did. Uh, I also assumed that I wouldn't get appointed. Thank you for the answer. Thank you. May May I make one more comment? I think from well, from Ina Stevens, Elko, Nevada. Um, you know, I think it's really important in this time at this time that we look at and listen to the indigenous perspectives at all levels because you know our world and our our habitat and our environment is changing due to climate change for whatever reason it's happening and we have knowledge that you know you don't find in books you know and and so I think it's important if we're going to maintain balance like I said earlier and if we're going to protect those things that are the most important that live in the environment, then it's important to listen and have those discussions. I know it's hard, but it's necessary. Thank you. Ms. Stevens, thank you so much. I really appreciate that comment. And I believe that Assemblyman DeLong maybe had a question. Yeah, I just have one last thing. Thank you for the indulgence, Chair. Um, the, the group that's presenting right now is you know, advocating for a change in uh, the composition of the commission, which I think they're actually advocating for something bigger than that, and that's a change in the policy of the state relative to a specific industry. And that really is the job of the legislature to decide what is the policy of the state towards mining. And I think that's the discussion that needs to happen first, if it needs to happen at all before we start talking about changing the composition of a commission. And so, um, Chair, if, if this does go anywhere, it really is, is the, is the state going to be um, promoting the mining industry or just along, just like many other industries, or are we gonna select out one industry um, to not support anymore? I think that really is the operative issue in front of uh, this, interim committee. Thank you so much, Assemblyman, and, and Mr. Hatter and Ms. Stevens, we thank you so much for your comments because this is an interim committee of the Nevada legislature, and so these are obviously issues that we are deliberating on, it, and we thank you so much for your time, just as we thank the Mineral Commission and Nevada Mining for their presentations as well. It's important that we receive all perspectives, so we're thrilled to have had both of you in. And on behalf of Great Basin Resource Watch and the Western Shoshone Defense Project today, are there any other questions from the committee? Okay. Seeing none, I thank you so much for your presentation, and that concludes item number 10 on the agenda. Before we move to item number 11, which is a discussion on hunting and wildlife management in Nevada, we are going to break for a half-hour lunch. It is now 11.57 a.m., so please return to those seats at 12.30, and we'll be looking to get started on item number 11. Thank you very much again for attending today, and for the thoughtful questions and thoughtful presentations delivered by all.
Welcome back, and thank you so much. So sorry for the very expedited lunch period, but we appreciate everyone's being back here on time, and we're going to respect your time and respect the weather in Northern Nevada and get us started on the next agenda item, agenda item number 11, which is a discussion on hunting and wildlife management in Nevada. We have two presentations under this item. First, we'll hear from Larry Johnson and Kyle Davis representing the Coalition for Nevada's Wildlife. Thank you so much for joining us today from Carson City. Please introduce yourselves for the record and get started when ready. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Kyle Davis, this time on behalf of the Coalition for Nevada's Wildlife. Uh, thank you for having us today. Um, I'm primarily here just to uh, provide technical assistance, so I will turn things over to Larry to introduce himself and go through our presentation. Madam Chair, committee members, thank you for allowing uh, us to appear today. Uh, my name is Larry Johnson. I'm president of the Coalition for Nevada's Wildlife. And uh, the, um, while our wildlife resources belong to all of the public, uh, it is the sportsmen of the state who fund and provide the great majority of the protection and enhancement. Um, while, while, uh, while sportsmen provide over 95% uh, of the budget for wildlife management, we're only represented by approximately 56% of the Wildlife Commission positions. The other positions are held by general public, conservation, ranching, and farming. Other state boards are exclusively their own special interest. Uh, for example, agriculture uh, significantly affects wildlife. However, we have no representation on their board. We're nearly a billion dollar economic driver to the state each year, but we have no representation on the Board of Tourism. Similarly, mining has great impacts to wildlife, but we have no seat um, on the Commission for Natural Resources, nor do we want these positions. Uh, the Wildlife Commission is the most democratic, diverse board in the state because they represent sportsmen uh, with our representatives that come from all walks of life, all ethnicity, uh, all religions, rural, urban dwellers, and all age groups from kids to the elderly. Um, sportsmen are not content uh, to just support our wildlife with our license tags and special excise taxes. Private sportsman organizations have donated tens of millions of dollars and have provided tens of thousands of volunteer man hours. In a great partnership with the Nevada Department of Wildlife, we have restored wildlife populations that were nearly or entirely extirpated during settlement of the state. Uh, this graphic shows the original range, the range reduced by settlement, and the current ranges of bighorn sheep due to the reintroduction efforts that are the most ambitious efforts in the country. From near extirpation levels, we now have more bighorns than any other state other than Alaska. We also have more elk, antelope, and mountain lions than any time in recorded history, increasing bear populations, and a new moose population, and on and on. Uh, one of the slides, this slide shows uh, in yellow the range of antelope that have been restored to the state just in the last 40, 50 years. Uh, on the right shows the range of Rocky Mountain elk that have been uh, spread across the state, both from pioneering and, and these efforts. Uh, just sh show this video. This is pretty exciting, okay? This was two weeks ago on top of the Montana mountains. We're releasing California bighorn sheep uh, into this mountain range. They were caught the day before in the Sheep Creek Range. <laughs> One sportsman organization wrote a check to completely cover the costs of this capture and release. Uh, our volunteer 
man hours building year-round water developments, guzzlers, expand viable habitat for all forms of wildlife from bugs to bats to birds to big game in the driest state in the Union. Indel tracks and uses these man hours as a state match for federal funding, also sportsman dollars, Pittman Robinson funds, to completely fund two full-time water development crews, one north, one south in the state, including all salaries, construction equipment, and materials for water development. And as you see, everything uses this. I mean, that's a spectacular picture of those bighorn rams uh, in the upper left. And in the lower right is a pair of ringtail cats. How many of us have seen these little rare nocturnal animals that, that frequent these uh, water developments? It's pretty absolutely amazing. Um, We finance major habitat improvement projects, such as wildfire restoration uh, with donations and proceeds from special big game tags inspired by sportsmen and passed by the legislature. Uh, heritage tags, Silver State tags, and Dream tags have raised millions of dollars each for these purposes. As always, the genesis lobbying for passage and the continued support comes from the sportsman community. And as you see, just with the dream tag, they have funded over 60 projects uh, and raised over $4 million in, and have expended, I believe, with federal funds, I believe that's a $30 million uh, contribution. These are but examples of the projects funded by these specialty game tags. No other state has the level of sportsman involvement, private funding, and volunteerism that Nevada does. The Nevada Department of Wildlife is almost entirely user-funded agency with us that provide the lion's share of funding, holding a slim majority on the Wildlife Commission. I would ask our detractors of how much funding or volunteer man hours that they have invested in Nevada's wildlife. All we really ask for is the scientific management of our wildlife resources. And we're talking about biological science. We're not talking about emotion-based decisions of wildlife management. We have more than earned our level of representation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions here in Southern Nevada? Okay, I'm going to hand it over to Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod. <clears throat> Thank you. I, this is really more of a comment. I just wanted to uh, thank you, Larry. Um, we had the opportunity to meet recently, and and um, your stewardship for the state of Nevada is honestly unparalleled. So uh, thank you. It, it it took me a while to sort of wrap my head around the fact that that sportsmen can be um, stewards, and as someone who doesn't hunt myself, but. Um, uh, I, I appreciate what you've done, and I know my colleague, my former colleague, Greg Smith, was, I don't know if he's still there, but um, just learning about uh, his hunt for the for the goat, the wild goat, was, was quite amazing, and um, I just wanted to thank you for that. Uh, in, in reply, I would, I would say thank you very much for the comment, but you see, hunters are the ultimate conservationists wildlife conservationists in this state. We put our money and our sweat equity where our mouth is in this subject. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Johnson and Mr. Davis for the presentation. I believe um, Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch also has a question from Northern Nevada. 
Thank you, Chair. And thank you for presenting all this information, especially on the conservation efforts, which I think are very important. Um, I noticed on your side, and it was mentioned in previous presentations as well, the phrase that it's the most democratic and diverse board in the state. And I just wondered, and, and you may not be able to answer this, so maybe we'll have someone from the commission come up, but could you just speak to the racial and gender makeup of the current commission right now as it reflects that diversity? Yes, for the record, Larry Johnson. And my, my comment was those representatives represent the most diverse group in the state, okay? As one of the leaders of sportsmen in the state, I want the most qualified people. I could, I'm a Native American. I could care less about the gender, the religion, the political affiliation, any of the diversity issues on a commission, I want the most qualified people. And that's what our commission is selected from. Thank you. Madam Chair, if I can follow up quickly as well. Um, <clears throat> Kyle, da Kyle Davis for the record. Um, the one note that I would make on this subject, because uh, it's obviously come up in previous presentations um, and um, has been a, t a topic of discussion, I think, certainly in our view, the, the role of the statute, and what I think is the role for most boards and commissions in this state, the role of the statute is to set the qualifications of the members of individual boards and commissions. In terms of determining who ought to serve in these roles and, you know, and making whatever, you know, whatever balance that appointing authority might want to see on that board or commission, that's really up to that appointing authority because the 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 statute does set forth those qualifications, but ultimately, at least in the case of the Wildlife Commission and the Commission on Mineral Resources, which we've discussed today, that appointment comes from the governor. And the governor really has that ability to shape that board or commission based upon um, what he uh, or she might want to see uh, as the makeup of those boards. Thank you. And Madam Chair, if I could add, please, that I think the history of this commission um, shows that, for example, Ms. Tina Nappi, who was a Sierra Club uh, member executive, actually served on our Wildlife Commission for extended periods and honorably, and one of was one of our strongest supporters. Uh, I believe you have a correspondence in your record from Miss Tiffany East, who served as uh, chairman of the Wildlife Commission. Um, extremely talented and, and competent individual. Uh, but again, I go back to my earlier comments that when when we're talking about management of our natural resources, I want to see the most qualified people available appointed to that, and certainly through the selection process, our governors have done that. Thank you. Thank you so much to you both for your response. Is someone from the commission available who could also respond to that question? Thank you, Chairman Pazina, Kaylee Musa with the Nevada Department of Wildlife for the record. Um, I didn't know if we had commissioners still in Carson City, so I came up since our ones down here left. Um, currently, there is one female on the commission. I don't have data on the racial background. I can supply that for you guys if requested. Um, however, I would also like to add that uh, it really depends on the applicants that get um, submitted for those positions. and. I have actively tried to recruit females um, to apply for commission seats in the past, but I'm sure, as you're aware, $80 a day um, plus a significant time commitment and the materials provided to the commission that um, they need to study before commission meetings is a, is a significant requirement, uh, time commitment for, uh, for applicants. So I don't know if that's part of 
um, what is going into the decision to not apply, but um, I don't want you guys to think there is not an active, uh, 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 there, that it, we aren't trying. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And did someone come to the table who might have still been present in Carson City as well? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Shane Rogers, for the record, and thank you for the question. And in terms of um, the diversity, I think uh, Ms. Muso uh, summed it up from a specific diversity aspect. But I think a lot of the things that, that get missed sometimes from a diversity standpoint is, and I think it was touched on earlier by uh, Chair Cavillian, his presentation, the fact that we are one board However, we are nine individuals, and that diversity comes from a diversity of backgrounds of industry and experience, both on the business and the, and the uh, conservation side of things. So I think other than, than race, gender, color, creed, I think there's a tremendous amount of diversity uh, in that existing board as it sits. Mr. Young, I, I noticed you there as well. Did you have anything to add? Uh, thank you, Chair Fazina. Uh, I will uh, say a ditto. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Do we have any other questions? Senator Scheibel. Thank you, Chair. I, and I'm sorry to, to beat this same drum, but since we're talking about different kinds of diversity, do you, does anybody have an idea of like the age diversity? Do we have young people serving on the board? Um, do we have people in you know, different phases of life who, who serve on the board right now? So, so as to age, thank you for the question, uh, Senator Scheibel. Um, as to the age, I think we range from the high 30s. Mr. Young, please state your name for the record. I apologize. Paul Young, Board of Wildlife Commission. Uh, late 30s to late 50s. And again, I'm, I'm just guessing. I apologize. I don't have the hard. Maybe Kaylee has the hard numbers, but that would be kind of the range of age. That's okay. I, I wouldn't expect um, us to ask people their age before we appoint them to a board. I was just looking for kind of a general idea, and that helps me uh, get a picture. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions from the committee? Okay. I don't see any here in Las Vegas. I am not hearing anything. Please jump in in Northern Nevada if I'm not seeing you. All right. Well, thank you so much for part one of number 11. We thank you very much for the presentation and appreciate the opportunity to have to be able to hear you today. Um, we're going to stay on agenda item 11 and next we'll hear from Henry Krenka, president of the Nevada Outfitter and Guide Association. Mr. Krenka, thank you for joining us here in Las Vegas and please introduce yourself and begin your presentation when you're ready. Uh, for the record, Henry Krenka, K-R-E-N-K-A, -E and I'm, also, I'm president of the Nevada Out Outfitters and Guides Association, and I thank you for your, my opportunity to speak before you today. Um, uh, on this, the, these are issues of concern of the guiding industry, are predators, habitat, and management are the main ones. And I'd like to address these issues briefly. Um, not only does predator control help manage wildlife population, but it also keeps predators from overpopulating and helps to avoid outbreaks of disease such as rabies with controlled management of the predator results in less diseases. Managers, management of predators has also an impact on wildlife. Myself, I've witnessed 10 coyotes take down a 300 pound calf right in our hay meadow. If this can happen while being witnessed, can you just imagine what they're doing to the wildlife out in the forest and the wilderness areas? Loss of habitat occurs on overgrazing and wildfires. Overgrazing wildfires or in public grants are a result of poor management by government agencies. 
management of the wildlife has been damaged due to the lack of support from the State Wildlife Commission. And they don't have the best intentions when it comes to managing wildlife. They don't support the public and sportsmen when issues regarding wildlife are brought to them. The Nevada Outfitters and Guides Association, guides and other outfitters, sportsmen in Nevada, and the County Wildlife Advisory Board members have attended meetings and felt that their concerns are ignored. And I'd like to say that I agree with everything Mr. Johnson said in his presentation. I thank you for your time on this. Thank you very, very much. And that was a very sad picture you painted, I will say, as well. I'm going to have that calf in my head probably the rest of the day. Um, do we have any questions down here in Las Vegas? Okay, in northern Nevada. Um, Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch. Thank you, Chair. I just would like some clarification on um, if there is a lack of support or there is an issue with the commission, what is the proposal to address that? Well, um, in the past, I've been president for 15 years, and I've been going to county deals, and I've been going to legislature and the state wildlife deal. Um, it, it depends. I believe right now we've got good representation. We've got a good director. I think things are going to change for the better. But what bothers me, we get a new governor in there, and he's going to appoint a different director, and everything can go totally the opposite way. So, you know, I, um, I feel that we need to have more people on the board that are um, from the outlying areas that spend more time out in the field. Um, that, that's, where, that's where you learn what's going on is you're actually out there in the field with them. For, and the outfitters, you know, I'm not saying we should know what's best, but we're out there almost year round. We see what's going on. When we come to these meetings and we tell them, uh, commissioners what we see and this and that, and personally, they just look at me and go on to the next agenda. I'm um, supposed to have attended workshops and that, and like I say, this is in the past, but my workshop is, is supposed to, by regulation, I'm supposed to have three workshops. The one they give me was three minutes at the podium, and that was it. No questions, no nothing. And when, you know, it's once you're up there, you can't go back up again. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Okay, do we have any more questions for Mr. Krenka? Okay, not seeing any questions. We thank you so much for your time and you can step back from the table and that will close agenda item 11 and move us into agenda item 12, which is a discussion on the composition of the Board of Wildlife Commissioners and Commission on Mineral Resources. And for our next presentation, we'll hear from Mr. Patrick Donnelly, the Great Basin Director for the Center for Biological Diversity, and Laura Martin, Executive Director of the Progressive Leadership Alliance of Nevada. Both are joining us here in Las Vegas today, and thank you for being here. Please introduce yourselves when ready and begin. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Patrick Donnelly, Great Basin Director at the Center for Biological Diversity. Uh, with me is Laura Martin uh, from the Progressive Leadership Alliance of Nevada. And we're going to talk about equity and justice and the composition of the natural resource boards and commissions. Um, and I think I'll just start by saying there's a whole lot of policies we could come up here and debate uh, about wildlife and mining that, that are concerning, but really this, this presentation is meant to focus strictly on the composition of these boards and commissions and how more representation within those boards and commissions could lead to better policy. Um, I won't belabor this slide too much because I think we've heard about it quite a bit today. The Wildlife Commission and its composition is established statutorily uh, and of course it is uh, heavily slanted toward uh, hunting and ranching and farming which are uh, uses of wildlife that typically uh, revolve around killing wildlife. 
uh, and of course the geographic representation uh, limits uh, uh, the overall number of commissioners uh, to three from Clark County. The Commission on Mineral Resources is of course um, composed of members of industry. Um, and you will note it's almost exclusively formed by members of industry except for one member to represent the general public and the person appointed in that position right now also comes from industry. Um, but now I'll just focus a little bit on, uh, on what that all means uh, in relationship to the population of Nevada. Uh, so with regard to the Board of Wildlife Commissioners and geography, um, Nevada's total population is 3.2 million people and Clark County has 72% of those people. And yet the commission limits the amount of people in Clark County to 33% of the commission. Uh, this means that a huge amount of Nevadans are underrepresented on the Wildlife Commission. And you can look at these comparative numbers for the other categories. You can see that Washoe County is actually overrepresented on the commission. Um, and then the remaining counties, the rural counties, are vastly overrepresented on the commission, comprising 45% of commission seats with only 12% of the population. Uh, and so uh, this puts Clark County residents at a distinct disadvantage as to having their interests represented on the Wildlife Commission. And we can also see these disparities in terms of how people interact with wildlife. Um, hunting and fishing license holders comprise about 3 to 4 percent of Nevada. Um, people employed in farming or ranching compose less than 1 percent of Nevadans. Uh, and yet hunting and fishing license holders comprise 56 percent of the commission seats. And farming and ranching get 22 percent of commission seats. This is vastly overrepresenting the interests of those sectors on the commission relative to people who don't hunt and don't farm. Uh, and we don't exactly have a metric for people who are conservationists in the state of Nevada. That's not really a metric we have. But I did look at a recent poll from Colorado College uh, to sort of get a proxy for people who support conservation. And that's people who support the 30 by 30 initiative, protecting 30% of lands and waters by 2030. And that was 79% of Nevadans who support conservation of, of lands. Um, and so uh, allowing that that's a very rough uh, proxy for the number of conservation supporters in the state, you know, the conservation uh, interest on the commission, the Wildlife Commission, is just 11% of members. That's one member. And so we might haggle over the number 79%, but we can see there's a disparity between the general support for conservation uh, across the state in a non-extractive manner and uh, the 11% representation on, uh, on the commission. Great. Hello, um, I had a Red Bull for lunch, so pray for us. Um, my name is Laura Martin. I'm the Executive Director of the Progressive Leadership Alliance of Nevada. Um, I like to say I have the most diverse board in the state, but I'm happy to be part of this presentation with my dear colleague Patrick um, because I grew up on the front range of the Rocky Mountains in Colorado Springs. Pikes Peak was my 14,000 foot compass in my neighborhood. And I'm also one of 13 kids. And so I spent a lot of time in nature because that's free. Spent a lot of time camping, fishing, hunting in the mountains. And moving to Nevada in 2007, it was, it was just so different the way people engage with nature, engage with wilderness, and also frankly are educated about it. It was required part of my curriculum as a public school student, and not just to lobby for mining, but also just to understand the history and the role we play in the, in the future of having access to our wild lands. Um, so everybody knows Nevada is very diverse in ethnicity. Um, we get that information from the census, and we know our business partners use that information um, to advocate for businesses to move here, to talk about how, how diverse our state is. Um, we can look at these numbers, we can read them ourselves. We have close to, you know, a third of our population identifies as Latinx, AAPI, Black Nevadans, Native Americans, and of course, white. We do not track the racial um, makeup, racial and ethnic makeup of these boards, but I think if we when I think about the, the wide range of diversity, maybe we should, and as well as the diversity of age, physical ability, um, as well as gender. 
So we've already pointed out that, you know, some of these boards only have one woman on them, two women on them, and I heard someone say, um, it's hard to recruit women. I wouldn't want to be on those boards either, right? I want to make sure I'm part of a commission and board that's about the education and the survival of our wildlife, of our wild lands, and not necessarily about um, the lobbying and the preservation of these industries that extract wealth from our state. So why we say representation matters. As our state continues to grow, we know that we are still a small government state that, re that relies on a lot of volunteer or low paid boards and commissions to basically effectively move policy, maintain um, a lot of industry. But we need to make sure that we are showing that Nevada is for everybody. Not just the, the close knit good old boy people who have always done it and then they recruit their friends when they're time to retire. But how are we tapping into students in the different colleges or teachers or professors or retired parks managers? How are we ensuring that if we're going to use the science, our scientists part of this? Um, and so being sure that we're looking at racial and ethnic diversity, gender diversity, geographic representation. There's wild lions right outside this window, past the cemetery outside the window. Um, and also a diversity of interest in our natural resources. It's okay, the world is not gonna end if somebody on this commission doesn't think that our public lands are just to make us money. It's okay if we think about the ecosystems and the preservations of our state as well. A lot of these commissions are heavily dominated by industry, and it almost feels like, especially Division of Minerals, it's just a state-funded lobbying firm. And we have to consider, is that what we're using our very limited state resources on, funding a state agency that's lobbying for a multi-billion dollar, probably trillion dollar now, industry? So the current structure of these boards and commissions, you know, they just disenfranchise a lot of frontline and indigenous communities. And unfortunately, as the planet continues to heat up, the front line is also moving. Right now, Grant Sawyer Building is in a heat island. That is also the front line of, a, of the way that our world is changing and making sure that people who sit on these boards and commissions reflect not only the people that live in rural counties, not only people who like to hunt and fish, but also people who just love this state and see it as an education, a way to educate people, and a way to people for deep, to deepen their love of this state. And so, um, just like plan is, we are very intentional about who is on our board, and I do think the commission should be very intentional about who they choose for their boards and why. Um, and again, I do want to thank you all for giving us the opportunity um, to present today. I'm really proud to do this with Patrick, who is a fearless advocate for all of this work. I'm sure um, there's people grumbling behind us and on the phone to hearing his name, but that's good. That's the work that needs to be done because our public lands are worth it. And I'll just add one more thing, and that's we're not making specific recommendations for allocations of seats here. Um, you know, this is a complex topic that will take more debate than can be had in one day uh, at, in this room. Uh, we do recommend that you put forward a BDR uh, to change the, uh, or multiple BDRs, to change the compositions of these commissions, and that we can have a robust debate about that during session uh, where it would have the time it needs. You know, I think clearly indigenous representation is quite important, and the other types of representation we've been talking about here, but I think we didn't make specific recommendations in this talk because uh, it, it really does require quite a bit of uh, input and debate. Thank you. Mr. Donnelly, Ms. Martin, thank you so much for the presentation. I believe Assemblyman DeLong has a question from Northern Nevada. Uh, thank you, Chair. Appreciate the presentation. Um, I, I was going to ask a question, but you actually didn't make any recommendations, so I, I'll just have something to say. First off, um, you implied that the Division of Minerals is funded by the state. It's not. It is funded by fees from... From, the, from industry, whether it's uh, mining claims or permit fees. So there's no state funds that go to supporting that division or the commission. Um, I, I appreciate all the information you provided about the um, uh, various demographics of the state. Um, it's, it, it's interesting to have that information. Um, I'm just gonna reiterate my previous statement um, before the lunch break, and that is, this really is a policy discussion that we're having. 
about what commissions should be charged with. And that is for the legislators to decide. Um, it's really not, I think discussing what the composition of the boards are at this point is premature. If you really wanna have a policy discussion about these commissions, it should really be what is the policy that the, that the commissions or the divisions are promoting. And that's set by the legislature. Thank you so much, Assemblyman. And again, I think the reason that these interim committees are so important is because it allows us to bring these discussions out and to have opposing voices share their passionate thoughts toward policy and legislative action prior to the start of the next legislative session. So I appreciate everyone's involvement and engagement here today. Um, I believe that um, Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch has a question and then Assemblyman Gurr. Thank you so much, Chair, and thank you for coming and presenting. I seem to have led right into your presentation on demographics with the previous presentation, so um, I appreciate you bringing that racial breakdown. I am gonna have to disagree with my colleague about um, our discussion today. I think we are the legislature. I think this is the legislature, and we are discussing policy in the legislature right now. And so with that, I feel like it's been brought up and I'd love to throw it to you as the presenters. What do you think the role of these commissions should be and what do we need to do to make sure it aligns with that vision? I can go first. This is Laura Martin for the record. Um, thank you for that very thoughtful question that really helps move the conversation forward. I do think if uh, this is a policy discussion, the question is then who gets to decide who decides the policy? Is there gatekeeping or is there, there an intention to ensure that that policy is directed by the most diverse voices possible? Patrick Donnelly for the record. You know, I think the Commission on Minerals plays a variety of roles, but they are regulatory. They regulate mining exploration, oil and gas, geothermal. It's a regulatory agency. And certainly the the Wildlife Commission and Endow are regulatory. And so clearly the, the role of these commissions is to regulate and to oversee the regulators. And so by its nature, they should not be dominated by the regulatees. You know, they should have uh, uh, independence such that they are performing an independent oversight role on the regulators. Uh, and so ultimately, I think it's appropriate that these commissions are, are overseeing the regulatory agencies, but as such, they really need to have independence from the regulated industries. Thank you. Assembly Gar. Thank you, Chair. I was just going to say ditto to everything Assemblyman DeLong said, but after the last comment, I'll throw a question out. Yeah, the industry is being regulated by the regulatees, but what would you do with the doctor's commission? What would you do with the attorney's commission? What would you do with the real estate commission? I spent six years on there, and we regulated the people who, who the regulatees, we, we oversaw what they did. And that's exactly the role of the, the commission today, and I think they're doing a damn good job. Thank you. If I may, Madam Chair. Patrick Donnelly, for the record, I would just say I'm not so sure the real estate industry is benefiting Nevadans right now. Uh, so, uh, you know, perhaps there should be some independent oversight of the realty industry as well. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your passionate comments. And again, I would just remind everyone whether, you know, we're members, whether, you know, we're testifying, you know, all of us have passionate beliefs and to respect all of us here today. Um, did we have any questions here in Las Vegas? Senator Gokachia and then Senator Scheibel. Got one too. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and you know, demographics are fine, and it, it's great to talk about the two million people that are living here right here. Uh, I guarantee you, when I left home this morning, I got far more wildlife on that little piece of a desert I've got in northern Nevada than, are, than are, is here in this valley. So. Again, demographics fine. It's fine to talk about population, but you've got to bring, in any of these commissions, you've got to bring a level of expertise. And so I, I do take exception when you say, okay, it's only half a percent from, uh, you know, of, uh, of farmers and ranchers are engaged. I, I would like to see your matrix on how much wildlife resides their whole life on some of those private holdings, those ranches and farms. They live there. 
and yet you're saying no, there's only that's only a half a percent, so they shouldn't have any say in the process. The guides and outfitters, the sportsmen, these are people that are engaged. You've got to have a certain level of expertise on any commission, whether it be the real estate board, whether it be uh, the minerals commission, or the wildlife commission. And again, just population won't cut it. I'm sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry, I'm short. Uh, Laura Martin, for the record, I appreciate you saying this. Also, it's an honor to sit in front of you. I know this is your final legislative um, process, and thank you for all that you've done for our state. I do, for me, I do, um, it's a little bit of a pinch to hear when we're talking about how can we be not more diverse with gender, race, ability, veteran status, um, and the automatic assumption is, well, we need expertise, as if those people can't be experts as well. And I know the chair has done a good job of holding people accountable for how they talk about each other, but also, you know, we've heard people from the Mining Association use words like people are hysterical, you know, radical, loud, as if those aren't very gendered and racist language to describe the people on the left. And so I do think there are experts where you live in the rural parts of the state. Again, I'm from Colorado Springs. I know farmers, ranchers, all of that. We're not saying no to you, but also how are those farmers and ranchers mentoring more people who may want to be involved in these boards and commission and broadening the scope of who can apply and who wants to be part of it? Touche. <laughs> uh, before we call on Senator Scheibel, no. <laughs> I would like to say it, it's so important, I think, to sometimes disagree without being disagreeable. And I really appreciate the conversation just now between Ms. Martin and Senator Gokachia. And with that, Senator Scheibel. Thank you so much. Um, I think that this actually is a really interesting way to think about the Wildlife Commission as a regulatory agency because what it does not have in common with regulating the legal industry or the real estate industry or the mining industry is that you can't tell wildlife what to do. <laughs> um, and so what we're this is really kind of a proxy for, for regulating ranchers and farmers and recreationalists and hunters and anglers and fishers because we can't directly control the wildlife that lives within our state borders and where they live and how they live and what they do. Um, we're a little bit better at doing that with human beings, but even still, it's a challenge. Um, and so I think um, what, I, what I'm interested to understand is I think that you guys do a great job, you've done a great job of kind of elucidating how we bring balance because um, we do have representation from those industries that I just mentioned that are, are by nature being regulated. And so is there an equivalent um, business model for a, a person or a group? And I'm, think, I'm thinking it's you all, but help me help me get there uh, is there a business model for you know if a rancher is a business that you know is interested in utilizing the environment for one particular purpose and utilizing resources in one way to produce the food that we all eat that we need in order to survive is there an equivalent on the other side is there an industry that depends on the land being undisturbed and depends on the land being um, hospitable for a while if and depends on the land being um, natural and wild, or it, do we have to have a human intervention to say this is just a value that we have because of its inherent value? I'm Patrick Donnelly for the record. You know, I would say ecotourism is a huge part of the state's economy, uh, and some of that is hunting and fishing for sure, but a lot of it is not hunting and fishing. Uh, and so that's definitely an industry that benefits from the management of wildlife uh, that contributes to the state's economy. I think we could probably describe several others. However, I would also say that the proper management of wildlife and habitat is part of conserving biodiversity. Um, biodiversity gives us clean air to breathe and clean water to drink and puts food on our plates. And uh, without biodiversity, we ourselves are at risk of extinction. And so, uh, you know, managing the wildlife of the state, not for the benefit of extractive use, but for the, the whole benefit of, of functional ecosystems and preservation of biodiversity is essential for all of us. Um, uh, and so, 
you know, we could probably come up with metrics for the ways that contributes to the state economy, but I would say there's also values other than the economic benefit of, of wildlife and ecosystems, and, and so that would be my response. Thank you very much. And I believe we have a couple more questions up north from first Assemblyman DeLong and then Assemblyman Gurr. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate the additional uh, opportunity. Um, I wanted to respond a little bit to uh, Mr. Donnelly's comment that the commissions just regulate uh, their respective uh, divisions or departments. They actually have a mission that's broader than that for wildlife. It's for conserving conserving wildlife, um, improving habitat, et cetera. And so, and for the division of minerals, it's um, promoting uh, mineral education, uh, promoting um, the industry and so it's not just a regulatory responsibility and, so, and that is one reason you need to have um, a broad set of expertise um, on those commissions. Okay, thank you very much and I believe Assemblyman Gerd, did you change your mind? Was there not another question? Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you. If you do, please proceed. And if not, um, does anyone else have any questions? Okay. Well, thank you so much um, for all of the wonderful questions from the committee. And we thank you very much, Ms. Martin, Mr. Donnelly, for your presentation. And with that, we will. Chair, I did have close. one question, I think, oh. that was missed in the chat. You stepped back too quickly. Yes, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Assemblywoman, please proceed. Uh, thank you so much. I apologize for bringing you guys back to the chairs, but um, I just had a question. We're having this discussion about regulation and who should be overseeing these industries and, and who should be making sure that all these regulations are being followed. My question is just, are there other commissions or other entities that are overseeing these two areas, or are these the only regulatory bodies that are overseeing these areas? So are you at Laura Martin for the record? Are you asking like who regulates the commissions or? No, I, apologies. I'm asking for the mining industry outside of the commission. Is there another entity that is regulating them? Um, as my colleague alluded that they're not just regulatory agencies, they do other things. If they're not regulating, is there someone else that is overseeing them as a regulatory body? Well, I would say, Laura Martin again, uh, the different federal agencies like the Bureau of Land Management and some other states, the, the Forest Service, um, hopefully I'm answering your question. Patrick Tomley, for the record, certainly with mining, the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection has a significant regulatory role, and they're governed by the State Environmental Commission. Um, we haven't talked about the SEC here today, um, but that is a, a whole different discussion. Um, but, you know, they do have a regulatory role as well. I mean, the, the Commission on Minerals regulates specific elements of extractive industry, you know, oil and gas, geothermal, mining exploration, um, but not actually mine permitting. Thank you. Okay, any other questions that I may have missed from Southern or Northern Nevada? Okay, I think um, before um, you get called back to the table, um, Mr. Donnelly, Ms. Martin, thank you so much again, and we will officially close item number 12 on the agenda. And that moves us to item number 13. Lucky 13, discussion on Senate Bill 88 from the 2023 session, um, rationale behind studying natural resource agencies and commissions. And this is our last presentation, which will focus on SB 88 and the rationales behind it. On this, we're going to hear from Dr. Michelle Lute, co-executive director of Wildlife for All, and Mr. Fred Voltz, a member of the Nevada Wildlife Alliance. Thank you so much for joining us here in Las Vegas, and please, Introduce yourselves and proceed when ready.
For the record, Michelle Lute, I'm one of two co-executive directors of Wildlife for All, and I'm having trouble finding presenter view for my presentation. But this is how wonderful our broadcast showers. team is. I would just like to give them a shout out. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And, and thank you all for allowing us to present today. Um, so I'm going to give you some perspective on the national context of state wildlife management and finish by describing some policy changes that various states are considering to improve wildlife conservation. What I want to talk to you about today is informed by a growing body of wildlife conservationists, commissioners, researchers, legislators, and advocates from across the country, including hunters and anglers. In response to increasing calls for reform from these diverse sectors, Wildlife for All was formed and a national coalition organized. We are collectively working to close the gap between American democratic values and preferences for wildlife conservation versus current state policies focused solely on hunting, angling, and trapping. The central thesis of this presentation is that we are living in a time of unprecedented crisis, namely climate change and biodiversity loss, and trying to address these modern challenges with a system that has not been updated since the 1930s. That system is state wildlife management. The problems with the system, sometimes referred to as the North American model of wildlife conservation or wildlife management, are the same in every state, more or less. First of all, its origins are rooted in late 19th century thinking. It is a system that was developed in large part by hunters like Teddy Roosevelt, primarily for the benefit of hunters. Since it hasn't evolved much since its inception, decision making continues to be dominated by hunters, anglers, and trappers who can constitute a shrinking minority of the American public. Therefore, it prioritizes the production of harvestable surpluses of a handful of game and sport fish species over a diversity of other species in need of conservation. And by doing so, it further disenfranchises the many diverse stewards of land and wildlife across the state and all the states in North America. The resulting system is out of step with modern science, norms of democratic governance, public trust principles, and changing public values. A 2018 survey comparing American values regarding wildlife with those from almost 20 years prior revealed a shift towards mutualistic views, whereby value, people value wild animals for their intrinsic value and as uh, members of a broad community. Yet current policies don't reflect these values. So I've only had time to very briefly introduce some of the problems with the current system, uh, but I'd like to spend the rest of my time on solutions and share with you some policy reforms that are being considered in various states. In this fourth one that we often include a recommendation for of defining wildlife conservation, I won't have time to talk to you today, but I can follow up later if you're interested in hearing more about that. So one of our, our first recommendations is to revise outdated statutes. We recommend that legislators look at the mandates for wildlife management in their state statutes to see if, need, um, if there's a need to be updated to prioritize the protection of all species and ecosystems and recognize both the ecological and intrinsic value of all species and align with public trust principles. Again, given the constraints, I'm moving quickly and I can only, um, uh, I can follow up with detailed examples of these recommendations as well as more background on the details of the public trust principles. Another recommendation is to democratize governance of wildlife management. Some states are considering measures to do so. These include abolishing wildlife boards or making them advisory only. Uh, another recommendation is to make boards representative by revising statutory, statutory barriers to serving, some of which already been talked about today, um, as well as balancing geographic and proportional representation and ensuring legislative confirmation hearings happen and are serious opportunities for legislators and the public to assess candidates on important pro policy matters and their qualifications uh, based on science. Uh, another recommendation is reviewing rules related to public input to ensure that they allow meaningful participation, including remote meeting attendance. And then a uh, last one under this category is creating nomination committees uh, that are well qualified and tasked with providing well qualified recommendations to the governor to fulfill vacancies. 
Diversifying current funding, I think this is where the rubber meets the road for a lot of folks. State wildlife management prioritizes game management and consumptive users largely uh, due to historical funding structures, but only an average of 35% of funding comes from hunting, fishing, and trapping licenses. Additionally, federal grants from the Pittman-Robertson and dingle Johnson Acts provide 23% of funding. 73% of which comes from non-hunting and fishing sources. I want to I wanna really repeat that and let that sink in because I think there's been some other statistics today that ignore the fact that 73%, the vast majority of these federal excise taxes are not coming from hunting sources. They're coming from the purchase of guns, handguns, and ammo that is not used for hunting but is used for home defense or the shooting sports that are not related to hunting. And this is uh, according to a 2021 report from Southwick Associates, as well as a number of other statistics federally available. Most state wildlife agencies get little or no general fund appropriations, which reduces public accountability and is at odds with the public trust principle that any, everyone benefits from wildlife and should bear in the cost of protecting it. Many states are looking at options for new sources of funding for wildlife. We recommend that any new funding source not be tied to any use that could, that could skew policy to favor particular user groups or interests. And with that, um, I will just conclude by saying, um, you know, we talk a lot about crisis, the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, and it can be overwhelming, um, but I think with crisis comes opportunity. Faced with the prospect of losing revenue sources as well as relevance to the general public, states like Nevada face a choice. They can embrace a new paradigm, which includes a more comprehensive mission, a broader constituency, and more diversified funding streams. And by doing so, everybody wins. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Lute. Um, Mr. Voltz, did you have anything for us? I do. I do, Chair. Thank you. Fred Volz, for the record, speaking for the Nevada Wildlife Alliance. I'd like to amplify some of the things that Dr. Lute has had to say on a national level and make them very Nevada-specific. Uh, we need the study that was the subject of SB 88 uh, in last legislative session to identify all the policy issues that need to have an open and complete discussion. We have not done that. And the legislature, because it's 120 days, or even the Sunset Subcommittee can't really do that in a thorough way. So I want to go over quickly a list of open issues that need further discussion on an impartial basis about Wildlife Commission operations and how NDA operates. Uh, we've heard earlier from public comment that uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service reported that a total of 63% of Nevadans are mutualists, meaning they support coexisting with nature or pluralists, and they believe killing wildlife based on the situational context and purpose is important. Only 22% responded that they want to exploit and manage wildlife exclusively for human benefit, and 15% of the state's population uh, really didn't care one way or another. So effectively, and, and unfortunately, the Wildlife Commission and Endow are textbook examples of regulatory capture. This is where the people buying endow licenses control and skew the entire system for the exclusive benefit of licensees. By contrast, this bias is not tolerated at the Nevada Gaming Commission or the Gaming Control Board, where incumbent commission and board members can't be actively connected to the industry they are regulating. And also in public comment, there was a statement made, which is very accurate, that there are few tangible qualifications for being a wildlife commissioner, except that a majority must have purchased an endow license. However, buying a license doesn't indicate any level of scientific knowledge or training to meaningfully and impartially shepherd the state's wildlife and suggests an inherent conflict of interest in votes taken. Such pay-to-play procedures eliminate qualified candidates who don't have the ability to pay. Regarding the cabs, interesting subject. It's a good day when six out of the 15 cabs show up at a Wildlife Commission meeting, even though they have a statutory obligation to do so. The Wildlife Commission keeps funding these operations when they don't meet locally and don't attend the commission meetings. Two counties don't even have cabs. The cab membership has no uh, qualification requirement, except again, 
buying a license, which is more pay to play. And there's only one position, just like on the Wildlife Commission, at a cab that can be for, from the general public, even if they have the qualifications and the experience. The executive director mentioned about how they make an attempt to uh, make the Wildlife Commission meetings open to the public. Well, at least two meetings a year are held in places typically that have no access. And uh, the reason that they claim they need to go there with 50 people in tow and uh, housing them and uh, keeping them for three days or so uh, is that uh, they have to see the locals and engage with them. Well, the locals don't show up at these meetings. And moreover, the problem with the uh, locations is that they could have Endow staff go out and videotape any facilities they need to see. They won't do that either. And I'd like to get into funding in two ways, uh, again, specific to Nevada. Uh, there is most definitely general taxpayer support for wildlife, and it consists of the Bureau of Land Management, the U.S. Forest Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and National Park Service collectively spending $19 billion in fiscal year 25 for their operations. With over 80% of Nevada's total land area operated by these four agencies, whose funding comes from all federal taxpayers, not hunters, trappers, or fishermen. Uh, thus, the general non-licensee public makes significant financial contributions to the maintenance and perpetuation of the public's wildlife and habitat. Nevada's pro rata share of this public funding far eclipses NDAO's $66 million annual budget since our state has nine and a quarter percent of the 680, 608 million acres that the federal government manages nationwide. Additionally, uh, we've, we spoke about the Recovering America's Wildlife Act briefly and earlier, but there is another funding source that we have not tapped into uh, that goes way beyond the four wildlife and out convert public property to private use without paying any compensation to the public treasury uh, that is a very inequitable situation. We have a severance fee structure in place for mining and other natural resource extraction activities on public land, and it needs to happen with the public's wildlife, which is public property and to be held in trust for current and future generations. The minimal fees paid to endow for licenses and tags don't begin to represent the lost value to the public when wildlife is permanently destroyed by licensees causing disruptions to the ecosystem. Also, the unilateral appointment of commissioners by the Nevada governor uh, contains no advise and consent function. You saw in the support materials that 10 of 11 Western states typically have their state senate overseeing these appointments to 200, in Nevada's case, boards and commissions. We have so, no such mechanism in Nevada, and that is really bad governance in the same way that we have a judiciary and a legislative and executive branches of government and they're all supposed to balance each other out so that no one of them has uh, any sort of uh, unfair advantage. Uh, we, could, we have had unqualified appointees and uh, we need an oversight function. And finally, I would say that going forward, the, the, again, the study that was vetoed by the governor claiming that we didn't need legislation to have a study uh, needs to be conducted in a workshop style format where these complex issues uh, have, can have multiple comments uh, and not just a, a comment period at the beginning and the end. Uh, also, if there is a, any sort of dispute between the governor's legal counsel and the LCB's legal counsel about the need for legislation to conduct the study, uh, it would be wise to ask, ask the attorney general for a formal opinion as a good way of resolving how to proceed or what's the best way without violating any legalities. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Valtz, Dr. Lute. Do we have any questions in Las Vegas? <laughs> um, it doesn't look like we have anything here in Southern Nevada. What about Northern Nevada? I believe we had Vice Chair Anderson actually, who had a question. Uh, thank you. And 
There's just a lot uh, with this. As uh, I thank you so much for the presentation. First of all, what I was going to bring up, you just brought up, and that has to do with the the lack of confirmation. We we do not have legislative oversight of those confirmations. And as I was looking through a document uh, that was actually presented in 2022, it's a 70-page document of all of the different commissions that are required by NRS statute. None of them require legislative approval that or of who exactly would be on there. So I just wanted to, to verify in both Dr. Lutz's confirmation, uh, information and then also in uh, the last presentation as well, that you believe that there should in fact be legislative confirmation hearings for who should serve on these boards? Or is that just one area that you are advocating for? That's number one. And then number two, I struggle with this subject, um, not with the actual conversation happening at Natural Resources, but I'm struggling with this happening during natural resources items because it does feel a little bit more like a government affairs issue since there are so many different commissions and so many different boards that are required by, not, by um, NRS statutes. So I just wanted to put that out there as well, but just wanted to confirm that you are in fact advocating for the legislature to have oversight of the executive branch appointments when it comes to these boards. I'll try and answer that. Uh, not necessarily, it could be a citizen's board uh, there might be some other construct because the legislature is not full-time as we know and you have a lot of other things to do and there's probably no interest uh, particularly in having yet another accountability to add on to all of that. So a citizens committee might be the way to go. We need to have the conversation though as a state because it's just a bad governance process that we have. And you're right, maybe government affairs is the appropriate place for that. Uh, that's what the study should bring out. It should say, we need to refer these issues one place, we need to refer these other issues other places. But until we have the in-depth conversation, just passing a bill that says, okay, we're gonna add a couple of wildlife commissioners, or we're gonna do one other little adjustment around the edges, doesn't really get at the root problem that the current construct of the Wildlife Commission is undemocratic, it's unrepresentative, it's unfair. Take all the uns you want and put them together. It is not operating for most of the population in this, in this state who don't buy the licenses. And that is the core problem we need to get to and come up with solutions for. Follow up if I may. Chair. Yes, please. Thank you, and, and thank you for that answer. I. I do not want us, though, to start bashing departments. And I understand the frustration that is present um, from more than a few entities, it appears. I don't believe that this language is being brought forward to try to bash that department or the people that work in it, um, but it does feel that way a little bit. And so I think we need to stick to the issue of are the commissions working as they should, and from your belief and from the study that we're trying to get through, or trying to do a little bit more in depth, the answer would be no, so how do we fix it? But I would ask that, that we try to show a little bit more respect um, to the departments and the work that they do. I understand the frustrations coming through, but our employees are overworked, and I wish that we would start treating people with a little bit more dignity for the work that they do put in. Thank you, Chair. If I might just, uh, Michelle Lute, for the record, um, just thank Assemblywoman Anderson for those points and would just like to emphasize that, um, you know, we're critiquing a system um, that is protecting the status quo and is not evolving to meet the needs of everybody. So I invite collaboration uh, and I appreciate what you're saying and would just like to emphasize there's no personal indictment of, of anyone. Um, and I have been a state wildlife biologist for the state of New Mexico, so I understand those pressures. I'm also the daughter of multiple generations of farmers in the Midwest, so I understand those pressures. And so having those conversations with our, our multiple different hats and identities is really important, and that's why I think we need to keep this conversation going. So again, thank you. Thank you so much for those comments, and thank you, Chair. May I add to that, 
Chair, thank you. I, I don't disagree with anything that you said, Assemblywoman, but I would say respect is a two-way street. Sir, please give your name for oh, the record. Oh, sorry. Fred Volz for the record again. Uh, I don't disagree with your uh, comments about keeping things civil. I think we've done that. But I also think that when uh, people who are outside of the status quo are trying to seek, for, seek change and they are basically completely ignored and dismissively treated, uh, that is a problem for the hardworking bureaucrats of our state that they need to address. Uh, they need to treat the people they're supposed to be serving with respect and hear them out and actually implement things that make sense. And unfortunately, in my 14 years of attending the Wildlife Commission, uh, that has been in very short supply. Thank you. Assemblyman DeLong, I believe you had a question. Um, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I actually wanted to follow up on uh, uh, my colleague's comment about uh, um, the having legislative um, oversight on appointments to commissions. You know, if we have 200 commissions in the state, just assume that there are five members on each commission. That's 1,000 members. Let's say they're on four-year cycles, so every two years you're going to see 500. That means the Senate would have 500 um, confirmation hearings in a 120-day session and trying to get through 1,200 bills. It's just not realistic to have that happen. So just to put that on the record. I do have a question regarding the funding uh, discussion that occurred earlier. Um, you know, the state currently does get um, funds from the uh, Pittman-Robertson uh, fund, and I, I'm not going to argue your point on what percentage are um, just shooters versus hunters. Um, is it your suggestion that because, let's say, 70% of those funds are from just shooters, not hunters, that the state shouldn't accept that money? Michelle Lute, for the record, uh, no, that's not my suggestion whatsoever. Okay. I think it's just an important clarification on the context around um, who pays for conservation. Okay. And then as a follow-on to that, is it your position or your suggestion that, that the uh, Department of Wildlife and the Wildlife Commission should be uh, solely funded out of the state general fund to have the most, quote-unquote, democratic distribution of funding sources? Michelle Lute, for the record, uh, I think more funding from the general fund could help with accountability and funding an underfunded agency that's very important. Um, the state wildlife agency's work uh, benefits everybody, and so I think there needs to be a more equitable distribution of, of funding streams, and we can talk about uh, more creative ways of finding those funding that uh, doesn't come from an already... Um, strapped budget, for instance, um, and that's where I think the continued conversations and creative thinking need to happen. Um, you know, there have been uh, various suggestions around uh, broadening the kinds of gear that gets uh, taxed, and of course taxes aren't, aren't um, always very popular, and the outdoor industry has pushed back against that, but I think there are, there are voluntary ways. Uh, so another creative idea um, is to look towards um, animal shelters and how they fund um, with voluntary funds. So folks that go to PetSmart round up at the checkout, and that becomes the biggest funding for all kinds of animal shelters, including municipal animal shelters across the country. So just those voluntary uh, donations could help fund conservation. So that's just you know one particular creative idea that might not work in Nevada, but there are definitely very diverse folks who are interested in conservation, wildlife, the ecosystem some services that we all benefit from that are willing to, to help pay and expand these, these funding streams. I think that those, that volunteer um, funding is already existing in the state of Nevada. We heard the, the, the department talk about how they meet their match with the Pittman funds. Uh, a lot or almost all of that comes from volunteer efforts from 501c3s. So that very much exists. The concept of going to a general fund funding of the of the department um, given Nevada's small government approach and um, limitations on increasing taxes um, 
would be extremely difficult. And so I'd love to hear your creative ideas on how to do it without changing taxes. I appreciate that. Michelle Lute, for the record, another thing to look at is an example in New Mexico where the state land office has um, increased funding through uh, conservation licenses on um, conservation uses, non-consumptive uses on state trust land. So um, perhaps broadening the kinds of licenses if people don't want to buy a hunting or trapping license would be another way to... Um, explore if it's possible. Again, these are just examples. I don't, I don't want to belabor any particular example. Uh, I just think uh, with more conversation, we can find what's, what's best for Nevada. Thank you. Dr. Lute, thank you so much. I feel like I should pick your brain for more creative options because these have been very helpful and, and they're very, very much appreciated. Um, also to your first point, Assemblyman, uh, you know, I, I think the discussion on legislative oversight only came up as a consequence of the NCSL presentation earlier. Um, however, I, I think, you know, even with the discussion between Vice Chair Anderson and Mr. Volz that made a lot more sense maybe from a citizen oversight or, or some other function since we're a part-time legislature and can't be in special session constantly to look at those appointments. Um, I, I completely agree with you, Chair. Other... I completely agree with you, Chair. I just wanted to put that on the record on what it would mean if there was actual legislative oversight. So I'm in agreement with you. Okay. Wonderful. Do we have any other questions for Dr. Lute or Mr. Volz? All right, anything else up in Northern Nevada? All right, well, thank you both so much for the presentation, for staying here until close to the bitter end today. And that officially closes item number 13 on the agenda. And we've arrived at the official last item on our agenda. I bet no one ever thought that was coming and we might get some people out safely after all soon. But before we can do that, we've arrived at public comment, our second period of public comment to call in. We ask that you dial 888-475-4499. And when prompted, please enter meeting ID 857-5226-9048 and then press pound. Broadcast and production, staff, production services staff will indicate to you when it's your turn to speak. Please remember to clearly state and spell your name and limit your comments to two minutes. But first, do we have anyone in Las Vegas or Carson City who'd like to come to the table and speak for the record? If so, we ask that you just come up to the front. We can have three people at a time at the table in Las Vegas and I believe four in Carson City. And we will get started in, it looks like we have four in Carson City. So let's go ahead and get started in Carson City since we started in Vegas this morning. <clears throat> Madam Chair, members of the uh, committee, my name is uh, Willie Molini. I was director of the Nevada Department of Wildlife for 16 and a half years uh, back in the 80s and through 1998. I've worked uh, a great deal with uh, the Board of Wildlife Commissioners in many facets. I've seen it change in number. I've seen it change in composition. I've worked with a number of different commissions because of the different positions feel, filled by different individuals. So I think I have uh, considerable experience with working with the, the Wildlife Commission. There was a lot of, there's been a lot of topics covered here today, and I'm not going to try and address all of those, but there was considerable discussion about good governance or about, yeah, good governance. And I think that the measure of good governments is the end product. And I would submit to you that the management of wildlife in the state of Nevada is really solid and successful. And therefore, I think it's a measure of, of good governance. Uh, I can say without equivocation that the Nevada Board of Wildlife Commissioners, at least during my tenure, and I admit that was some years ago, uh, uh, was composed of very, very qualified people who carried out their policy and regulatory responsibilities in a very fair and reasonable manner. In watching the commission, over the recent years, and I'm involved in five different boards that have to do with fish, wildlife, and the environment, 
I would say that watching the commission recently, that that still holds true, that they operate in a very responsible, in a very fair manner. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about focus on, on consumptive uses, and yes. Sir, uh, and your I two think minutes are actually up. So if you'd like to just close out the comments with a final five to 10 seconds. I would very quickly, well, I, I would like to say that the, that, that the Department of Wildlife maintains a very comprehensive wildlife management program, including a robust non-game management program, a robust habitat program, and a law enforcement program that enforces all wildlife laws. And therefore, all wildlife is receiving considerable attention, and that hasn't been mentioned before. I thank you very much for the opportunity, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Um, once everyone, once um, a speaker has completed, we ask that they return to their seats so that if someone else wants to enter their chair and speak, we welcome them. Um, and just a reminder again that every speaker has two minutes so that we give everyone an opportunity and we get people out through Washoe Valley ahead of the snow, wind, and ice. And with that, we'll stay in Carson City for one more speaker and then we'll come down to Vegas. Excuse me. Hello, I'm Karen Taylor. I'm a Washoe County resident and avid outdoors, outdoors person. Uh, thank you so much for today's meeting. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I've been going to the Nevada Board of Wildlife Commissioners meetings for about 18 years now. I average about four to five per year. And I've seen some really good decisions made over the years. And I've actually come to really admire um, a lot of the Department of Wildlife biologists. Um, unfortunately, uh, the way the system works and the way that commissioners are selected allows for the extremes to control the decision-making process. I've seen sportsmen uh, put up their fingers and tell the board that they need to vote the way the, the tell the board the way they need to vote is the way the sportsmen think. Um, hunters do have a unique perspective that needs to be heard, uh, but. I also know that the board is under an extreme pressure uh, to identify and to do what their constituents um, want. Um, as a non-hunter, I do have a unique perspective also, and I am not heard. Uh, just by virtue of not being a hunter um, and having concerns about other wildlife issues, I am not heard. I have fished in two states with a third state coming up in June, and um, I want you to uh, think about Dingle Johnson. I'm also a non-hunting gun owner. Think Pittman Robertson. Um, I contribute to the excise tax. I can contribute to federal funds. Um, most all the money you've heard about is public money. Uh, over the time, I've donated money and volunteered countless hours for eight organizations that deal with wildlife and deal with habitat. Clearly, non-hunters contribute money, time, and other resources. Actually, wildlife and hunters have benefited from what I've done. Um, in addition, um, even if I did not Thank do these so things. Thank you so much. You're over two minutes. So if you want to just I'll, I'll give finish. us five to 10 seconds to finish. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Even if I did not do those things, as Mr. Volt said, democracy is not a pay to play because wildlife belongs to all of us. And, um, I just think that Nevada's wildlife and Nevadans der, uh, deserve a review of the current proceedings. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to come down to the two here in Las Vegas, then we're going to take two over BPS and then return to Carson City. Madam Chair and committee members, my name is Jana Wright, J-A-N-A-W-R-I-G-H-T. I'm a resident of unincorporated Clark County. The makeup of the Wildlife Commission needs to be a body that puts wildlife first, not the desires of the small percentage that hunt. There are changing societal views from broader constituencies that must be addressed by the Wildlife Commission. The non-hunting public has a voice, but is seldom heard by the Wildlife Commission. I speak from my 14 years of participation with the CAB and the Commission. A change is long overdue. Please start the process. Be the instrument for change. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Anula Wildrich, A-N-N-O-U-L-A-W-Y-L-D-E-R-I-C-H. I am a 20-year resident of Nevada, and I feel that it's essential that our Wildlife Commission respects the general public's views in order to foster trust, transparency, and legitimacy in conservation efforts. By incorporating and valuing public opinion, and here I'm referring to the non-consumptive -cons users and outdoor enthusiasts, policymakers can ensure that management decisions align with broader societal values. The track record of this commission, unfortunately, seems to indicate otherwise. Acknowledging public input not only enriches the decision-making process, but encourages a sense of ownership and responsibility towards our national heritage and the public trust, which does belong to all of us. And yes, the public is encouraged to attend and participate in the meetings. However, when they do, their concerns are often dismissed. And this is why I feel that a review of the uh, Wildlife Commission is not only imperative, but long overdue. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are going to go to the phones. BPS, can we please have the first caller? Certainly, thank you, Chair. To provide public comment, please press star nine on your phone now to take your place in the queue. Brian Burris for the record, B-R-I-A-N-B-U-R-R-I-S. I am the um, immediate past president and current director of Northern Nevada Resources, Northern Nevada Resources for Wildlife Habitat Improvement in Nevada, and a former elected official for Southern, uh, in Southern Nevada. Um, I have heard a lot today from some of our opposition in the wildlife community. I have heard some derogatory names called to us and, and a lot of vitriol that is probably not needed in the conversation. But what I haven't heard is how we actively manage the wildlife. I've heard a lot about diversifying the board and putting people of color or women or all these other representatives. But what I haven't heard again is how we make this better for our wildlife. And, and that's what our true goal is. As a wildlife conservation organization, I'm a conservationist first. I am a hunter, but I will tell you, I didn't even hunt this year. I didn't even hunt a single species this year, but I spent hundreds of hours on conservation. My organization alone, one tag that went this year for a quarter of a million dollars will actually have about a million dollars impact on wildlife. We need to keep the people on these boards that are doing the good work and working with our INDEL partners. Our INDEL partners are very, very good. They do very good work. And these guys out in the field, um, they know what they're doing. We are out in the field on a regular basis. We are doing projects. I will tell you, I, with other organizations, we have built a greenhouse for forage for our mule deer population to receive fire, fire prone areas. I have one of the most robust um, goose nesting box programs in the state of Nevada. I started a trapping program on state land, or a, not a trapping program, sorry, a, um, a banding program on state lands for ducks. I am starting a banding program for doves as we speak. We are looking at research projects on the fantail pigeon. So if you want to call us idiots because we're hunters and conservationists, that's fine. But know that UC Berkeley does not see it the same way, and they're asking us for our input. These are the people we currently have sitting on our boards. I encourage us to keep it the way it is and not lose sight of what the big picture is, and that is preserving wildlife in the state of Nevada for everybody in the state of Nevada. Thank you much for your time. Thank you so much. Right, two minutes on the dot, almost planned. Um, broadcast will take one more caller, and then we're going to return for two more in Carson City. Thank you, Chair. Caller with the last three digits, 249. Please press star six to unmute your phone. Chair Pazina and oh, thank you, Chair Pazina and and committee members. This is Karen Boger, B O E G E R. I appreciate this opportunity to speak. I'm a volunteer advocate for conservation, public lands, wildlife, and wildlife habitat for the last 50 years here in Nevada, and I currently sit on boards of three conservation organizations, two of them sportsman organizations. I want to ditto the comments of the speakers this morning for uh, sportsman organizations that pre presented quite comprehensive comments, as well as Willie Malini's comments just now and the gentleman who just spoke. But in addition, I want to say that my concern was about the purpose and need 
for this day because I believe any analysis should most effectively uh, focus on the accomplishments toward mission and goals of the commission. Wildlife health and viability demands decisions be made, as you know now, <laughs> based on what scientific data says is most cost effective and yields the highest benefit to wildlife. And this is the way we avoid perception that decisions are made subject to custom, to motion, popular vote, or who has the loudest voice. Um, regarding the diversity concern, hunting and fishing tra traditions and their role in wildlife management um, is uh, very much um, correlates with the need for public education. The fact that um, these traditions are fading away along with the uh, consecutive increase of our urban populations. I would ask that um, the committee focus your um, pursuits from this point on to avenues to educate the public from elementary school on to origins of wildlife conservation funding and management including understanding why the role of we're now over well over two minutes so if you'd like to give us five to ten seconds to wrap up all right well i think informed public consent of wildlife management practices can only be attained through education and that indeed provide would provide increasingly diverse cross-section of nevadans with knowledge and interest to apply for wildlife management positions inclusive of public land agencies and DAO and the Wildlife Commission. Thanks so much for this opportunity and for your public service. Thank you so much. Um, a reminder, we're going to go back to Carson City, and I would just remind everyone, if someone said what you'd like to say, it's okay to say ditto, and it's okay um, if you don't have two full minutes, that's okay too. We thank you all very much for your public comment, and we look forward to hearing them. So returning to our next two speakers in Carson City, and then we'll come back to Las Vegas. Thanks, Chair Pazina and the Interim Committee on Natural Resources. My name is Olivia Tanager. I'm the new Executive Director of the Sierra Club Toyabi Chapter, and I'm glad to be here with you all today in Carson City. I want to wish you all a happy Earth Month and briefly offer my comments in support of Ms. Stevens and Mr. Hatter's presentation, as well as Mr. Donnelly and Ms. Martin's presentation. Uh, Native communities are the original stewards of this land. The Toyabe chapter believes that those most impacted by the problem are closest to the solution. And for that reason, we strongly believe that the Commission on Mineral Resources should have representation from Native communities and other directly impacted community members. And we would support a study to look at the comp composition of the commissions that we talked about here today. We know that mining is a large industry in Nevada with interests that are sometimes in conflict with surrounding communities. To the extent that industry disagrees with that, great. There should be no problem for, uh, with anyone with looking at diversifying the commission. We heard a lot today about the need for commissioners with technical expertise, and I won't deny that that's important. But I also want to highlight the importance of native knowledge of natural resource management, uh, as my friend Fermina mentioned earlier today. We strongly believe that having commissions composed of a more diverse group of people with views that are more representative of Nevadans as a whole is critical for moving towards a more ecologically just Nevada. Thank you all for facilitating this conversation and for all the work you do as caretakers of our beautiful state. Thank you so much. Let's get to our next speaker in Carson City, then we'll come back for two in Las Vegas and then two more over the phone. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Chris McKenzie, M-A-C, capital K-E-N-Z-I-E. -E. I'm a local attorney, and please don't hold that against me. Um, I'm also a sportsman and a conservationist. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Uh, I was on the Wildlife Commission from 2001 to 2007, was chairman from 2005 to 2007. So I was a fairly young man at the time, so there is representation from different ages on that group. Um, since then, I'm uh, now vice chair of your Dream Tag Advisory Board for the uh, 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 collection of cash for basically selling opportunities for uh, conservation issues and, and conservation projects. I hope that that could be maybe a subject in a future meeting and we can elaborate more on that. I'm also your chair of the Sagebrush Ecosystem Council and that's basically uh, considering and protecting and mitigation of impacts on their sage uh, sage sagebrush biome and uh, so I you know a lot of a lot of experience I started on the wildlife advisory board 
back in 1998 for Carson City. Uh, I'd be very much happy to participate in this process future in the future, and I know my time is limited, but I just want to put on that record. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are going to come back to Las Vegas with the two gentlemen at the table. Thank you, committee and chairman. My name is Angelo Tiberti, T-I-B-E-R-T-I, -E and I wanted to talk about the five members uh, for the uh, Wildlife Commission Board that is all in question today. Uh, those five members are the sportsmen's, and that is a, all that's required to be a sportsman is three hunting or fishing license in the last four years. Um, it's a very minimal uh, requirement to go from general public to a sportsman. Um, but what it does do is it gives an individual interaction with Endow. It helps lead them into an area where they can learn more about our wildlife, about what Endow does. And I think that's a very uh, beneficial uh, um, thing to go through for a future commissioner. Um, a hunting license currently is $38 a year. A fishing license is $40 a year. So that equates to about seven cents per day or eight cents per day. Um, this is less than a cup of coffee made at your house. Um, so it's not a huge requirement. There are 63 different locations, not including the internet where you could buy your licenses. Your licenses can be purchased in a renewal fashion so that it automatically gets renewed too. Um, so the requirements are not an extreme thing, but they do help drive education for future commissioners. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Steve Jungi. I live here in Las Vegas, Nevada, and have so since 1980. Uh, as a conscientious conservation-based sportsman, I reject the term consumptive user. Consumptive means uh, tending to consume and being destructive and wasteful, and I find that very condescending. When someone spends thousands of dollars a year and numerous hours of conservation efforts and volunteer time, that is far from wasteful or destructive. Uh, to hear some of the speakers here today and throughout, uh, one would think that hunters and fishers are murderous lops depicted in a Disney cartoon, and that's simply a very elementary, ignorant, and emotionally based argument. Outside of the Pittman Act and Dingle Acts, uh, many of us do service projects to benefit wildlife. On many of the projects I've been on, I've been accompanied by other hunters and fishers. Stakeholders and hunters and fishers, I like to call them stakeholders because they do uh, monetize 95%. I know there are statistics that have shown different today, but uh, I would say roughly 95%. Going back to the, the uh, contradictive uh, percentages, um, just to put it into context, it was discussed uh, that many of these funds come from firearms owners. Well, just a quick research on pewresearch.org has shown that 67% of those who hunt own at least five firearms. So anytime a hunter buys an additional firearm, more tax dollars goes toward that, that Pittman Act. In short, uh, our current commission is not only effective, but also nationally recognized. As it was discussed earlier, um, due to these facts, I believe that the current makeup of our commission accurately depicts our demographic of stakeholders and has documented achievement. Any change to this commission appears to be a fix in search of a problem which simply does not exist. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. We're going to head back to the phones. BPS, we will take the next two callers. Thank you, Chair. Queuing up the next caller. Caller, you're unmuted. Please proceed. Hello, uh, Chair Pazina and members of the committee. My name is Deborah Struthsacker. That's spelled S as in Sam, T as in Tom, R-U-H-S-A-C-K-E-R. -E I'm an environmental permitting and government relations consultant and mining policy expert in Reno, Nevada. I'd like to speak today about the Commission on Mineral Resources and to underscore the importance of having a knowledgeable 
commission to help advise you as legislators on mineral issues that may arise during a legislative session. During a session, you're asked to make judgments and decisions on a wide array of very technically demanding issues. If they're environmental issues, you can rely on the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection or DCNR. If they're water issues, you can rely on the Nevada Division of Water Resources. And on mining issues, you need to have a group of experts as the commissioners and um, the Nevada Division of Minerals that you can rely on as fact and subject matter experts as you contemplate mineral resource issues, which are very important in our state. I would also like to follow up on a comment made by Vice Chair Anderson and thank the members of the Commission on Mineral Resources for all that you do for our state. We ask you to contribute your time and your considerable expertise with virtually no compensation whatsoever at all. As Nevadans, we should be very grateful that you are willing to do this. Um, even if you do not support mining, as a Nevadan, you rely on it because we all rely on mining for our phones and our cars and our electronic technology. So again, thank you uh, commissioners for what you do for Nevada. And I appreciate this time to uh, give you my comments. Thank you. To the second, we have, um, we're going to take one more caller right now from the phones B BPS and then we're going to move to Carson City and then back to Las Vegas, then back to the phones. Their caller with the last three digits, 600. Please press star six to unmute. Um, yeah, this is Tom Fennell. I'm a uh, Nevada resident and sportsman and conservationist based in Reno, Nevada. Um, my question today to our elected officials is to, to challenge the groups that are detect, detractors from the current structure to elaborate on how their perceived underrepresented groups ultimately create meaningful benefits to our state's wildlife. Trying to under, understate sportsmen's efforts to the benefit of wildlife, in my opinion, is incorrect. How would reducing sportsmen and sportswomen's involvement improve the situation? We need to consider this from a wildlife perspective. Despite appearing counterintuitive to those that are disconnected from wildlife management, active engagement in outdoor activities such as hunting and fishing fosters a lifelong commitment to supporting animals in their habitat. Over the past decade, I have dedicated my time to volunteering for a sportsman funded organization. This organization allocates millions of dollars toward research, habitat restoration, augmentation of wildlife populations. The proposed alterations to the commission's makeup do not stem from a desire to benefit wildlife for the greater public good. Rather, it represents the viewpoints of a minority faction that lacks a genuine connection with our state's wildlife and simply disagrees with hunting and fishing activities. In reality, these individuals are far less invested in our resource. Who are the primary contributors to the wildlife projects in our state? Sportsmen and sportswomen, who are the volunteers dedicating their time and money to reseeding after fires or conducting spring enhancement projects that benefit all wildlife, sportsmen and women? Who are the driving forces behind fundraising efforts through conservation groups and the purchase of licenses and tags that help sustain and grow our wildlife, sportsmen and women? Attempting to diminish the representation of the segment of the population most engaged and responsible for success and survival of our plant animal species is irresponsible. While it's crucial to maintain a healthy wildlife population for everyone to enjoy, there are scarcely any instances in North America where reducing the positive representation of sportsmen and women has led to improvements in habitat or wildlife. I urge you to reconsider any proposed changes to the commission makeup. Sir, your that two minutes are long role. up. If you want to just quickly yes. wind it up. Thank you. No problem. I urge you to reconsider any proposed changes to the commission makeup that would undermine the essential role by sportsmen and women in wildlife conservation. Preserving their representation is vital for the continued prosperity of our state's natural resources. Thank you. Thank you. We are going to go to Carson City, where last I looked, there was one person at the table, and then we'll come back to Las Vegas. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Robin Orloff. R-O-B-Y-N-O-R-L-O-F-F, -F, and please stop me at two minutes. <laughs> and uh, if you feel my comment isn't totally um, uh, 
appropriate for this particular uh, meeting. I've enjoyed uh, listening to all the uh, discussions. I'm a proud and grateful citizen, taxpayer of Carson City in Nevada, and an OHV sticker payer contributing to the OHV program grants. I want to thank Denise Baronio for her presentation and for the Division of Outdoor Recreation, all they're doing to play the way to preserve, conserve, and promote stewardship. Um, I, I'm a runner, hiker, mountain biker on Prison Hill. I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the uh, conservation and preservation at that particular area. And kudos to the Nevada OHV Commission and Program. Nikhil Nakarde leaving was a big loss. Thank you to State Parks, Novak, and Reconnect for this program. Um, the mission statement for NDC and RN Outdoor Recreation, as Denise said, advance and promote sustainable world-class world outdoor recreation. Conservation and stewardship driving the force for economic uh, equality. Um, protection and conservation of soil, air, and water. So I'm getting to my point. Speaking of water, um, I'm concerned about the designation of documented significant ephemeral stream washes on the rock crawler routes. Um, the rock crawler is six to eight feet wide, going up washes that are one to three wide, disrupting, destroying, churning up the wash floors, the banks, the slopes, intact of soil and vegetation, biotic crust that hold the steep erodible slope together, causing more erosion, loosening soil, and affecting habitats along the way. Designation of open areas, freestyle riding across intact soil and vegetation slopes um, in the successive parallel ephemeral stream washes on the west slope of Prison Hill. So we're getting contamination of the water in the washes um, f from the um, under undersurface of the crawlers as they're grinding up. Thank you so much. It has <laughs> yes. been a little over two minutes, so if you want to give me five to ten seconds to wrap it up. Um, I would just request that we communicate, collaborate, cooperate, have a conversation to address and resolve um, and to conserve and protect what's going on on the ground and preserve that resource since water is such a special um, resource in the arid desert. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, and I encourage you to come to our next meeting on May 10th where we'll have quite the discussion about water. Um, for now, though, we are going to come back to Vegas, and I believe you were at the table first, so please get us started. My name is Stephanie Myers, M-Y-E-R-S. Thank you, Chair Pazina and committee members for this hearing. I shared with a friend that we needed a study of the Wildlife Commission so that more people like me, a wildlife advocate, could actually have an effect on wildlife management other than the few minutes of public comment that we are given at every meeting. He reminded me that it didn't have anything to do with me, that it had everything to do with our wildlife itself. I realized that he was absolutely correct, but that wildlife did not have a voice. Who would speak for them? Imagine if your pet, your, your dog or your cat, could, could talk to you. They would tell you not only how much they love you, but also how they feel. Imagine if Nevada's wildlife could talk. What would they say? A study is just that, listening to all sides of an issue in more in-depth than today to see what kinds of adjustments might be made to the Wildlife Commission. A broader account of wildlife might yield patterns useful in a doomed to repeat it scenario. Who's been given a voice? Who's been underrepresented or left out entirely? And what course corrections might be called for? The commission should represent all residents of Nevada, not only hunters, trappers, and anglers, but also the general public who love our wildlife. But most of all, higher than any other, is to represent Nevada's wildlife. If the wildlife could voice their concerns, they might have a lot to say. I'll bet they would urge you to vote for a study of the Wildlife Commission Ms. Myers, and how it impacts past them two minutes. and how it might benefit them. Thank you. Look at that. What a wrap up. Um, since you are our last in-person individual today, I'm going to hand it to you and then we'll go back to the phones. 
Ron Stoker um, with Wildlife and Habitat Improvement Nevada. I just wanted to do a clarification on how the key Pittman money works. There was a comment that um, a lot of that is federal funding. That federal funding only comes to pass if there's a MASH donation three to one. So my organization that MASHed and donated 250000 to the Nevada Department of Wildlife, then it was matched by the key Pittman funds three to one, which made it close to a million dollar donation. Those funds aren't available without the efforts of conservationists and sportsmen or other nonprofit groups, 501c3s donating to Nevada Department of Wildlife. That being said, uh, one of my favorite quotes is by their fruits you should know them. So what are these other conservationist groups doing? Are they getting funds donated for the wildlife? That being said, I pose that question to you. You don't have to do it just with funds. You could do it with labor hours. Um, I'm raising five conservationists. One of my conservationists, my son Xander this year, made over $100,000 in volunteer match money by showing up to conservation projects, by putting his blood, sweat, and time for Nevada's wildlife. If you say that you speak for Nevada's wildlife, show up by your actions. Show up, do stuff. I'm a conservationist first. I'm a conservationist 12 months out of the year. The sporting season for me doesn't matter. And if hunting were to go away, I'd still be a conservationist. And listening to the commissioners that get paid $80 a day and our lawyers and engineers, they are not doing it for their own benefit. They are also conservationists. I leave that with you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. We're going to go to the phones, and I would just remind everyone to keep to two minutes. And if you hear something, say ditto so we can keep everyone safe and sound in northern Nevada. BPS? Thank you, Chair. Once again, to provide public comment, please press star nine now on your telephone to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 178. Please press star six on your phone to unmute. No response. Let me move to the next caller chair. Hello, can you hear me well? Yes, caller, please proceed. Thank you, and good afternoon. My name is Eli Turner. I'm a member of the Nevada Mineral Exploration Coalition. I'd like to provide some comments pertaining to the discussion over the Commission on Mineral Resources and the Division of Minerals, uh, beginning with the contributions of mineral exploration and mining to Nevada. The mining and mineral exploration industries are pillars of the rural Nevada economy and are deeply intertwined with our state's history. In several rural counties, mineral industry is responsible for over half of all jobs. Even if the mineral industry makes modern life possible, there is scarcely a better place for it to operate than Nevada, where industry is well regulated and there are efforts to mitigate impacts. I pose the question, how ethical is it to import commodities that can be produced right here in our own state? They will always be produced somewhere. Next, I'll share our comments on the Commission of Mineral Resources in our view, it's appropriate that almost all the members of the commission possess technical expertise as is currently required. Some groups recommend that the commission be composed mostly of members without technical expertise who have been, quote unquote, affected by mining, presumably in negative ways. While including multiple perspectives is very important, we believe this recommendation would create an extreme conflict of interest and inhibit the commission from providing pertinent and knowledgeable advice regarding the mineral industry. NDOM is not necessarily capable of providing the same level of technical expertise as the commission. It should be noted that, that industry, not the government, pays for the commission. And finally, I'd like to discuss the Nevada Division of Minerals. NDOM's mission is to encourage uh, and assist the mineral industry, and that mission should be credited for the industry's success in Nevada. It's the responsibility of the government to empower citizens to achieve and foster their well-being, so NDOM's support of the industry doesn't constitute a conflict of interest with its other duties. Caring is not the same thing as having a conflict of interest. NDOM provides additional services useful to all Nevadans as they discussed during their presentation, and NDOM's current mission and duties are appropriate in our view and have enabled it to be a successful organization in service of the state. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity for, to provide comments today. Thank you so much. BPS, do we have anyone else over the phones? 
Thank you, Chair. We have one caller I'd like to get back to. Caller with the last three digits, 672. If you would like to speak, please press star six on your phone. Caller, if you wish to provide public comment, please press star six. Uh, Caller, I, I you're think you came back to me and I already gave um, testimony. You came back to me for some reason. Oh, okay. I, I apologize. Thank you, sir. Uh, Chair, the, uh, the public line is open and working and we have no additional callers at this time. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, sir, here in Las Vegas. Good afternoon. For the record, my name is Nick Gully, and I come before you as a lifelong Nevada conser conservationist and active member of Nevada's Outdoors. I'm currently a volunteer with the Wildlife Habitat Improvement in Nevada, a.k.a. WIN, which is an NGA, NGO in our state, which 100% of our money stays within Nevada. I have been an NDOW volunteer for over 30 years and currently sit on the Mule Deer Enhancement Program and conduct daily volunteer hours at the Key Pittman Wildlife Management Area along with the Waney Kirch WMA. In 2023, I alone conducted 683 volunteer hours and traveled over 8,000 miles to perform conservation efforts for our Nevada wildlife, fisheries, and wild lands. The Wildlife Commission working with NDOW has been in existence since 1977 and has brought great things such as the reintroduction of elk in Nevada, building our guzzler systems for wildlife and fisheries and efforts. All wildlife are represented by Nevada's government agencies along with NGOs and other conservationists who bring millions of valuable monies to support our state's wildlife and the lands that the citizens utilize. A 2020 study conducted by UNR showed small game hunting license alone put over $38 million into our rural communities by purchasing products needed to partake in Nevada's outdoor activities. These monies did not include trapper's license fees, big game license fees, fishing license fees, or boat and OHV fees. I have yet to observe any of these en entities who are standing against the current Wildlife Commission participate in a full cab meeting all over our state. They have complained that they cannot travel to the rural communities due to distance. In my opinion, this is inexcusable reason to shut down any rural cabs. I have not seen any of the entities participate on our conservation projects, which are always open to the public. A majority of these folks are from out of state and do not reflect the opinions of Nevadans who utilize our outdoors. As a season ticket holder to Nevada's outdoor lands and wildlife, we choose to fund ourselves by paying taxes on ammunition, firearms, hunting, and fishing license. In 2023, Nevada's seen approximately 86,000 people apply for big game tags. That's approximately 430,000 applications which carry fees that allow NDOW to conduct their wildlife and conservation efforts. Sir, we're about 20 seconds over gotcha. the two minutes, so if you can gotcha. wrap up. Thank you. For the first time ever in 2023, 50 states, all 50 states apply for big game tags. To wrap it up, I want to say that our current commission is a working commission that for 50 years has proven itself. What has these entities proven to us? That'll be it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone else in Carson City or Las Vegas? BPS, anyone who's joined the phone line for public comment? Thank you, Chair. The public line is open and working. However, there are no additional callers at this time. Thank you so much. We want to get everyone safely through the Washoe Valley. So not seeing anyone else here in Las Vegas. Um, Carson City, I don't believe there's anyone else there. With that said, we are officially going to close that item on our agenda and move item number 14, public comment. And before we adjourn our meeting, I would just remind everyone that our next meeting will be held Friday, May the 10th, and we hope we have as good of a turnout because we will be talking about water, including a legacy bill of our friend seated on the committee, Senator Pete Gokachia, and the water buyback program, SB 176. So we have a lot of great discussion scheduled for our next meeting, and we hope to see you there. And with that said, this concludes our meeting. We're adjourned. <laughs>